I'm going to call into order the board finance for the special budget presentation on May 17th. And we um, uh, have two members of the board here uh, in person and then two more online at least. Uh, and so the first item on the agenda is to approve an agenda. Would one of the councilors be ready to make that motion? Move to adopt our agenda. Thank you, Council Barlow. Second. Thank you, Council McGee. Um, any discussion of the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to a vote on this. All those in favor of adopting the agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we have an agenda, um, which has first the public forum, and then we will have reports from, I believe, uh, seven different areas of the city budget. So the departments or funds. Um, the, is there anyone who is here to speak to the board at the public forum? Not seeing anyone in person. You see a hand up from former city council, Sharon Butcher. So you will enable your microphone, Sharon. Yes. Ahead. Can you hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yes, you can. Okay, very good. Um, so busy night and very appreciative of the presentations. Um, I'm going to focus. Um, so my my comments have to do with the budget, not anything beyond that. Um, I think that Councillor Bergman made a comment about uh, about one budget. Uh, I don't think you were at the presentation that night, Mr. Mayor, but he asked a department like what were they not able to fund? And that's that was a theme that I heard when I was part of this process um, of knowing what is outstanding or what is on their wish list. Not more than it's more than a wish list, but they wanted to fund but really couldn't do that. I think that's really important to give the public an idea of of what is there that is sort of waiting to be done and that it's still a priority. So I just wanted to say, I think it would be important to capture that in some way. So that's my first comment. The second comment really is gonna focus on DPW and traffic within DPW. Um, and it's gonna overlap a little bit with other DPW stuff. Um, I'm gonna speak about, um, and I uh, about hoping that this budget will consider replacing the kiosks that are present, most of them don't work well. Um, and I use the, the parking lot that's on Main Street and Winooski Avenue. And um, I, I just wanna tell you, I'm embarrassed by that parking lot, the way it looks. And a lot of visitors use that parking lot. That's their first impression of Burlington. And they really kind of question about how our city is falling into disrepair just from that parking lot. And it's dangerous for cars and for people. If you're trying to navigate it on foot, you could twist your ankle. I'm not sure why it hasn't been addressed. I know, Mr. Mayor, you remember I dragged you out there when I was a city councilor and made you walk it with me. And it's only gotten worse. And I really think that a small investment of paving that and dealing with some of the holes that now have parking cones around them uh, really would be helpful. So I, I really want you to understand that I do use it in my job working for the government now. Um, and um, I do interact with the public and I try to give Burlington a really good face and let them know that we really care and that uh, hopefully these things will be addressed, but there are comments and I don't think any of you probably use it to hear those comments. Um, so I wanted to talk about that. I'm hoping that that can be addressed in the budget. And um, the last thing I wanted to speak about was the residential parking program that went to stickerless process. Um, and I have concerns about it in my region of the city because of the university, the medical center and the baseball activities. I know that Jeff feels that there will be adequate enforcement, but I rarely see anybody out here enforcing. And there's no way for us to help 
with eyes and ears when there are violators because there are no stickers anymore. So you don't know, you know your neighbors, but you don't know violators. And I really question the if you're really trying to phase this out, and that would be to the detriment of some neighborhoods that really, really wouldn't survive without it, especially old neighborhoods that weren't developed with adequate off-street parking. So I'd like to see all of those things addressed in the budget. As I said, this might spill over beyond parking. It might be you know, in capital. It might be in other aspects of, of DPW. But thank you so much for listening to me. And uh, I hope you have a good evening. Great. Thank you, Sharon, for uh, the input. Um, I don't see, um, I don't believe there's anyone else. Um, online, who is seeking out a public comment. So, um, generally, this is not a time to respond to the public comment, but I, I just, you know, uh, Jim, you want to just quickly share uh, the plans for the that parking lots that you do? Yes, uh, the plan for the main and Winning Street parking lot, uh, that parking lot will be utilized as part of the Main Street Freight Streets project and likely as construction staging. And so our effort here uh, and our theory is that the plan is to use it for construction staging and then be able to improve it on the backside of the project. So as uh, former Councilor Busher mentions that it will be a good welcoming order uh, as part of the Gray Streets Main Street project. Great. We'll look at some more. And, and let's see how the uh, RFP proceeds for that parcel as well, maybe. Uh, yes. Maybe on the back side of it, a lot of development project there. So, right. All right, so with that, um, I'm gonna close the public forum and we will move to our first presentation, which is from DPW. And uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Chair. Great, thank you so much uh, to the Board of Finance, uh, City Councilors who are here. Uh, thanks for giving uh, DPW uh, four out of the seven slots tonight. We will work to move expeditiously. Uh, I am here to kick it off tonight. Uh, before I head off to a public works commission meeting, but we have a great team of public works folks here, division directors and the capital program uh, director who will help out for the subsequent presentations. So uh, counselors are aware are, that our mission is here. I am not gonna read through the minutia, but we have a number of different budgets that we will take in series tonight. Uh, it's important to kind of understand what is in the general fund for public works, and those are the items in blue here. Uh, the DPW administration and then activities in three different divisions. The other uh, items in black will be presented uh, separately tonight. Uh, our broader range of assets uh, is indeed uh, broad, and you can see them here. Uh, and happy to talk through any particular ones. Uh, as we look to FY24, our high-level budget goals, and I think uh, CAO Shad said, they don't change much year to year for the general fund. Same is true for public works. Uh, we seek to maintain our services, uh, continue the sustainable infrastructure plan, which is such a key priority uh, for the city and uh, these other activities you're seeing here. I think this year, given the strain on the general fund, we've worked uh, to find ways to maximize the general funds, our contribution to the general fund. You'll see here a historical comparison of our budget trends uh, this year due to a couple of factors that we'll talk about on the next slide, proposing uh, less revenue than was budgeted in the optimistic year of 23 and our expenses are budgeted to go up less than 1%. Uh, the drivers on the revenue side, uh, we budgeted last year to have parking revenues come back uh, fully from pre-pandemic levels that did not occur. Uh, and so we are ratcheting down the fine revenue of parking uh, from the high in, in the FY23 budget. Uh, we will also be using less one-time money for recycling cards, thanks to your contribution last year. Uh, we were able to implement a policy uh, to phase out the, the bins 
which have caused a lot of litter and also uh, injuries of staff. Uh, we will have some of these uh, carts still to sell in 24, but much less than we did in 23. Uh, proposing to increase billable revenue for tech services, the uh, effort uh, team that Nora Baldwin runs, and uh, Lee Perry, who's here, division director for maintenance. Uh, we are planning to increase our shop rate and our CNG, compressed natural gas, uh, fees for the third party customers to the city. Uh, lastly, we're proposing to increase the solid waste generation tax around 5.6%. To handle both the purchase of a new vehicle to pay lease payments and for the increased tip fees to drop the recycling off at Chittensaw Waste Districts uh, facility. On the expense side, uh, you're seeing the same delta for the carts as the first bullet. One hand, it was a reduced to one time revenue uh, benefit, but it's also a reduced expense on the expense side. We are also proposing to freeze two parking service agent positions as part of our effort to uh, be lighter on the general fund. We have uh, completed a significant reorganization with the parking services team, and we can talk more about that, but feel that we can provide the same level of service with these two positions frozen for the year. Uh, there's obviously increased fuel cost. Uh, we are proposing in this uh, budget to replace what has been a contracted inspector for sidewalk and paving work and have that be done by an in-house staff person neutral to the general fund as it's paid by street capital. But we uh, believe it will be a net savings given the high rate that we're paying consultants to do work that we could do less in-house. Um, as I mentioned before, lease payment for one of the new recycling trucks, uh, increased overtime for the street maintenance team. This is a relatively small increase, but uh, the trend over the last four years, we've been uh, far overshooting our overtime uh, budget, and we're trying to move the budget to be more in accordance with demand. Uh, we uh, have been benefiting greatly from having uh, a capital program director on staff this year. Uh, proposing to ship that staffer over to CT around July 1, which will be a net uh, neutral impact to the general fund. And we have also allocated a, a modest sum of $50,000 for a number of potential reclassifications that have been in the works but haven't progressed yet to, um, to you all. So trying to plan accordingly. There are a number of challenges that we're all facing for us. Uh, there are many interrelated and large capital projects. And right now, given the constraints on the capital budget, we don't have uh, a chunk of funding to bring in consultants as workloads grow. And so we are then needing to deal with that with all in-house staff. Uh, and so that at times allows projects or drives projects to slow down if we do not have the capacity in house to manage all the projects when they get hot. Um, also maintaining the production for revenue uh, targets, largely uh, Lee Perry's group in maintenance that does the sidewalk production does water resource, uh, catch basin work, storm water and wastewater pipe maintenance. Uh, we often get pulled to focus on unbillable work uh, and other priorities in the city which limits our ability to pull down the, uh, the funds from uh, revenue departments. Uh, thanks to CT, we're continuing to apply for grants to try to supplement uh, the, the smaller $23.8 million bond that was approved by voters. Uh, but this year and next year will be a constrained capital year as you'll hear more later. Um, and maintaining our fleet has become a challenge. The fleet is still growing uh, in part due to enterprise and special revenue funds, but we have the same number of fleet technicians each year. Given that we're not able to replace much of the fleet this year due to finances, there'll be more repairs as the fleet ages. Um, and then uh, we're continuing to manage the total uh, requirement. So I will just finish it up by saying one of the things I enjoy especially about this job is working with other departments uh, for their success. And I won't read through this, but 
uh, is especially gratifying when we get to work as a city across departments to get the work done. So happy to answer any questions. Yes, Barla, go ahead. Um, uh, thank you for that. I had a question about the frozen positions. Are those like unfilled positions? Correct. Um, and so are they just, they're empty because people have left or they're empty because I mean, this is part of the uh, February blue key. Uh, so I'm Jeff Patrick, the division director for parking traffic. So remember the reorg we did when we moved the ambassadors from the garages into the uh, parking services that added us 14 positions. But at the time we had openings in the garage. And so I think we're at 10 parking service agents right now, we so have four openings. We do have a couple applicants for spots, but we just we don't have you know the market is not supplying us with workers and we and we we are getting more efficient than we do for how we go to 25 to 24 hour service that we want to provide. But I think 12 we can get to that and you know, we have a strategy. So the two reason the two we think is a good step for each year. Thank you. Yeah. Just the terminology is yes. Um, I also had a question, and maybe it is part of the capital discussion, or maybe it applies here. But um, street maintenance does that include um, filling potholes and the patching, which isn't full street reconstruction? Correct. And so, and so I, and I've shared this with Director Spencer before. I was like, I have a real concern going into this year that our, we have a lot of streets that need, at minimum, some patching, something beyond filling the holes. And like a good example is Sanford Road, which was recently addressed. And thank you for doing that. Um, but there, Sanford Road is one of many examples that we have right now. And I'm wondering, um, rather than, you know, do we have a plan for patching? I looked at the um, DPW street reconstruction page online today to see what was listed there. Um, and many of the streets that need patching aren't, there's actually not patching. All the streets that are listed there are slated for, for full reconstruction. So I'm wondering what, um, if we're adding extra dollars um, to do more patching, given that, you don't have the budget for the capital budget for full reconstruction. And if we are, what's our, do we have a list and do we have a prioritization scheme other than people writing up inboxes and phone lines asking for their streets to be fixed? So, so John Ball and uh, the division director for the technical service team that manages the sidewalks and paving. And the answer to that is that we are still developing that list. As a matter of fact, I drove the streets Tuesday with one of our engineers to really kind of have a feel and sense of where the problems are and how we can make money that we have allocated for patching to go as far as reasonably possible. And what is a good investment versus what is already scheduled for a near term fair. And um, in fact, before I came here, I shared with uh, a less senior person who engineered the team they had done in 2005 in terms of how we identified, selected, like count account for every individual patch that needs a patch, and then how we bought it down based on the funding we have available. So that method of a long list of where the problems are, and then how we buy down that list in terms of order of priority is what we're working on. But what's different? The 2005 experience is that we actually have um, unit item costs built into our bids and, and awards. So uh, it's it's coming, but it's not where it needs to be as yet. Okay. And will that, once you complete that exercise, will that feed back into the budgeting process in terms of the dollars asked for, or will we, we be trying to fit the number of dollars we have to um, okay. early fitting the dollars we have? There may be. We're going to be creative trying to find other ways to find additional dollars if we can, but it's it's obviously we're looking at the constraint of a few challenges. One of them, of course, is you know, and costs have gone up since uh, acquiring the tax. 
mayor has been great in trying to allocate a significant amount of the existing capital money towards this effort, but you know, um, the erosion of increased costs, increased damage because of climate change, it's all a challenge and we have to make hard choices. And uh, I have driven Stanford Road, looked at it along with many others, and uh, I would I wouldn't disagree with Stanford with some attention. So we'll keep you updated on our efforts. One, once we have a list for the patching, we'll get that to you. And two, uh, we will keep searching for additional funds. That's an active conversation um, with CAO Chad and uh, the mayor. And I'll just say, uh, we're also going to the workforce of an NPA as a request, because I know others are concerned about this. So uh, we're working to get ready for that. I mean, the, I think the biggest piece is really to have a more continue more robust investment in real repairs as opposed to patching. But when situations warrant it, they're patching is the solution. Thanks to give us by for a few years. Good, thank you. Great. Um, I see uh, Councilman McGee, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chapin, for the presentation. I, my, question is about the um, projects that might be delayed as the result of the um, shortage for um, funding consultants and the inflationary pressures that we're facing. I wonder if you have any projects in mind that might be delayed as a result of that. Yes, uh, I can start uh, with that. Uh, paving is certainly one. We have scheduled this year to only do 1.3 miles of municipal paving this year. Fortunately, the state's doing a large swath of paving in the city this year, uh, but that won't be happening next year. So paving is constrained. Uh, North Champlain, we had a protected bike lane project uh, that uh, came in uh, with bids of about a half million dollars. Given our constrained capital uh, situation, we uh, rejected all bids and are trying to secure grant funding for a large portion of that project because we can't dedicate all of our local match uh, to, our, to this one project. Um, I would also say that not having a pool of consultants uh, when uh, large projects hit uh, to supplement our staff is also an impact. Uh, there's a number of projects on the capital committee's list that uh, fell uh, fell off the table this year. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any more hands online or in the room, so. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Councilor Jen, go ahead. Um, thank you, and um, thank you so much, Chap and Spencer and team. First, this is a comment first, um, and I think I talked about it during the um, general public affair about towing cars and 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 ticketing. Um, I just wanted to say it again to you uh, that we are very appreciative of the new plan that you brought forward, and also for recognizing that yes, we can do better and we will do better. I just want to say that. Um, to the question also from Councillor Barlow about the patching, I just want to assert that just yesterday they were in my neighborhood patching the streets and doing amazing work. And now we no longer make the request. And I think now you have a focus of just going around and doing what needs to be done. I want to appreciate that as well. Thank you. Um, now, my, my question is one your department is one of the departments, 10 departments receiving. Uh, um, general fund, and also you are one of them that receive at least ten percent of the general fund. You know, um, yeah, and I was just wondering, you know, if there were carried over um, uh, funds from this fiscal year to the next, and how much is that, if any? Uh, the largest. Thank you, uh, Councilor Jang, and uh, appreciate the comments on the on the patching. We'll pass that on to the teams. Uh, as it relates to carryover, the largest carryover requested for our department is the 170 or so thousand dollars from the one-time cart purchases from FY23. Uh, we've pushed the deadline back to the time to have to have recycling carts to July 1. 
uh, due to the supply chain challenges of getting all the carts in. We can't require people to have them if we don't have all the carts in stock. So that's the major carry forward uh, that we have. Is there any other substitute carry forward staff? Nothing that's coming to mind. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And also the other question is also your department is one of the few that have also received funding from ARPA, the ARPA fund that came in, into this. into this. So this year we don't have it, right? Um, and I was just wondering, basically, we did not lose revenue because you're not one of a revenue department. Um, and how did you compensate that? How did you compensate that knowing, yeah, that we don't have ARPA anymore? Right, the ARPA funds were particularly to support uh, parking, uh, the parking facilities fund and the traffic fund. And so they're not the part of the general fund operations that uh, I just presented on, uh, but they did fill a substantial hole in those budgets where revenue is still trending uh, below, below uh, 2019. Uh, and Division Director Jeff Padgett will be up in a little bit and can certainly speak uh, to both of those budgets. There is very limited, if any, fund balance in either of those funds after a really tough couple of years. And uh, that is not where I wanted to be after working so hard in the first seven years of my career to build up those fund balances. Uh, but COVID uh, has changed our operation dramatically and uh, we're gonna be struggling to rebuild the health of those two funds after COVID. Wonderful. Um, yes, and this is the last question, and it is specific to um, the increase in terms of diesel that you have processed for, let's say, $25,000. And I wanted to understand the correlation with now having some fleet that are electrics, right? And I still see like yeah, an yeah. increase, and I just can't make, can't make a story of, of why. Yeah. Yes, sir, uh, Division Director Lee Perry overseas fleet. So a lot of our electric vehicles, um, our admin vehicles, some smaller equipment. Most of our diesel is our plow trucks, our sidewalk tractors that we plow the sidewalks with. The majority of that is accumulated use during the winter time. So that's that's when a bulk of our diesel is used in that November to March time period. Um, prices escalated. Um, from what was forecasted last fiscal year, really jumped up late, early to fall through the winter. Um, so we had to compensate for that. Unleaded fuel prices have um, trended normal. We don't have to increase that line, but you know, depending on the winter severity, we may not use a lot of diesel. We use about 85,000 gallons a year, just diesel. Um, I think the quick answer, Lee, is just the vehicles that the electric, that there are electric options are the smaller, more efficient vehicles, the heavy utility vehicles that we're still relying on for the bulk of our heavy duty work in the city. There aren't good electric options at this point. We haven't purchased electric plow trucks, sidewalk tractors, for example, recycling trucks. So that's why our diesel consumption is still relatively flat. We are noticing that you know, gas product, gas utilization is starting to trend the right direction, uh, and hoping that with the growth in electric vehicles, that will continue. Yeah, I mean, and I think that the city is yeah, processing you know diesel through like an RFP. There are several organizations that supply it, and 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 we make a contract with one. Um, so basically, you're saying that last fiscal year, whatever we purchased, they had to request more funds because of the heavy, heavy duty uh, equipments. Like, um, okay. All right, wonderful. No further questions. And other than, you know, yeah, consider bringing back another budget with at least 10% cut and figure it out for us. Thank you. We we'll love you for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilor Jack. Okay, I am... Uh... Going to close the DPW, this first uh, DPW presentation. And next up is uh, Burlington City Arts. Um, oh, well, I'm following what's up close to the
All right, welcome, Bernie. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here tonight. Also, to experience other departments' presentations and continue to learn about our colleagues and the collective work that we do together. Tremendous appreciation for being part of such a um, devoted team of people in the city. Uh, noble quest for always doing things smarter um, and better. Um, we've really uh, spent a lot of time in this last period to uh, do our very best uh, in level funding. Um, and I think probably had conversations about level funding in and of itself is a cut. Um, we won't be the first department to say that. Um, we've also tried to be as realistic as we can in terms of what we can cut without really significantly impacting the services that we provide to people of Burlington and our friends around the state. Um, I think without going through, Sarah, without going through each part of this, you've had a chance to look at it. Um, and I do not want to read things from here. I want to maybe pull out three or four important ideas. Um, and these are questions that I remember both from a number of meetings this year, from last year's uh, budget concerns and questions that have arisen from city councilors. Um, I really want to note it is certainly in our strategic goals but just to pull it out, the whole question of equity and belonging and sort of how we approach that within our department, what we have done, it is really layered throughout the entire department, each wing, each aspect of what we do, whether it is the specific kind of program, the type, the staffing, um, looking at the pay equity, all of those things are embedded in the discussions that happen throughout. So it is layered and it is the way that we measure the effectiveness of our work. Of course, we don't do this alone. We do it with the equity, inclusion, and belonging committee of our board. We also do it working very closely with REIB. And um, it's a learning curve. It's a process that will continue. Um, I did say that we. You know, did our best at the level funding um, in our programming. Um, we've identified a few savings. Um, another form of saving is the attrition, which is uh, we have moved from 36,000 to 75,000. Um, we'll see how this year goes and do our best working within the budget constraints. Um, and then I want to make sure, because I know. Um, there, there's a piece in there that makes it look like um, we've made a significant cut in our budget this year of over 500,000. And I wanna make sure that you, you, that is that is something we'd love to return to the city, but this is actually something that hit our budget that was part of the capital uh, budget and it landed here and so, to, just to point that out so that it's not supposed to be in operations. Um, I also want to bring to everybody's uh, attention the importance of the growth in our scholarship fund. Part of this, I think, is um, a result of COVID, uh, a return of many children and families to doing things together at home making um, and creating community and being a part of things really has brought um, our services deeper into the community and returning to um, our facilities. And the, our scholarships have gone up significantly this year. One of the biggest increases that we've seen in addition to the children's scholarships for camps is, and we've identified this, we have some more research to do, but um, our people from the ages of 18 to 25. And 
some of that we understand. It's great because we've expanded our programs there. And the hardest group sometimes is to bring teams into your programming. But we've found that, well, we're doing a good job at that. They like the programming that we've created. They like being with each other in those programs. And we also are seeing that we probably have um, some of the young college students from around the community trying to identify exactly who these individuals are and different ways that we can work potentially with other institutions within the community to uh, augment our scholarship fund or to find new, new revenue that might support it. Because the kind of increase that we're seeing this year is more significant than the development team would like to add to um, their targets. Um, also, I think what has impacted us significantly and is also a post-COVID uh, is dealing with the downtown safety plan and how this impacts our department um, in a lot of our community programming, in, in particular in second year of City Hall Park and working with um, the marketplace. And um, it's really, you know, there's tremendous inflation in the cost of just about everything we do within that department. And at the same time, I think, you know, we're, we're looking at a real uphill battle in the philanthropic world because everyone was back out fundraising. So while we enjoyed certainly, I, I wouldn't say it, easier time during the pandemic, but there was a lot of attention because we were doing a lot of programming and a number of people shut their doors during that time. They just couldn't operate. Now everyone's back. And so the requests from a very, very large nonprofit world, I think you all know that Vermont has one of the highest number of nonprofits. So any state in the nation, um, we're, we're out there together. And there are many, many worthy organizations. So we're just trying to understand what that, that shift is going to mean. I think we have a very strong team and we have a very strong story, but don't want to be unrealistic about how far we can push our ability to go further to, to continue to raise more and more funds each year. Um, maybe I should stop there just to see if there's any questions. And Sarah, if you want to add anything into sort of the... I think the only other thing that uh, we talked about uh, making sure it was clear was that we know that there's a lot of interest in the April 8th Eclipse event that is going to be a big part of um, our, our parallel here in Burlington. Um, and we don't have anything in our presented budget right now related to that eclipse. Uh, we know that we'll need to do some... Um, We'll need to do some adjustments to make sure that our staffing can accommodate um, whatever BCA contributes, as well as other potential amendments. But we'll, we know that that's a conversation that is yet to come. So it's not in this this presentation now. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to say you know what what I know there were questions from. Um, some of the city councilors um, about, well, what did you really cut? I mean, we looked very carefully at what we were presenting in City Hall Park. We did 140 events last year. We're doing 119 events this year. Um, so there's some savings there. Um, we have uh, held back from bringing, bringing professional development um, to the organization back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, I think you can only hold off on that for so long and uh, the invented, inventiveness and ingenuity of the team really depends on making sure you're getting out with the best and the brightest and learning um, from those, from your colleagues that are not just um, local. Uh, and then I think you'll see a change, there's a change because some of the public art administrative cost um, will be managed inside of the capital budget. So it's not really a, it's not really a save baby. Exactly. It's just like identified somewhere else. Yeah. Um, 
to answer Sharon Busher's remark about like what you wish for. Um, well, we need a van and we know that there that's not possible and that would support our artist services to community places for uh, the programming that we do and also our event management. Um, we do need additional staff in our event division. Communications. Um, yes, communications, marketing. And um, we are hoping to do a feasibility study. Um, we've had preliminary conversations about what the, that cost would be to look at an event division with um, So that's just yeah, the big view. Any questions or thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Barlow. I just had a question about the scholarships. You talked about how scholarships have increased. Um, do you start out with a scholarship budget or do you see what, and how do you, what's your process for deciding on scholarships? Is that first come, first serve, or is it? No. Well, I mean, it is, it, it, this is a big topic of conversation now for our board and our staff. We're, we're going to spend a whole session diving into this because everyone has questions like what we did this year is we reserved a whole piece of our scholarship fund for uh, those with the greatest uh, need in the community. So we worked with like, just as an example, with King Street, we made sure that there were spaces held because our camps uh, sold out in a few hours. And so obviously, you know, there's inequity built into that kind of, when that happens, it's like those parents who can be at home at 10 a.m. in the morning and they are savvy at how to get in there and be on at 10 minutes at 10 and so forth. So like just the technology itself. Then there's just the um, whole, like how do, how do you do this? And so the Americans coming into our community or those underserved just not knowing sort of how the system works. And so we're trying to figure out how to be a whole lot more equitable with the way that we approach it. Um, and then the, maybe the final question that we're grappling with there is, is there something, should there be something built into this system or policies that speaks to Burlington residents? And this is a tough one because it sounds easy, like, yeah, Burlington address and Yes, it's the taxpayers of Burlington and so on, but we also know that there are so many people who would love to live in Burlington, they work in Burlington, but they can't afford to live in Burlington. So now are we, you know, where's the equity there? So we're, yeah, we're... <laughs> and I want to say that in the, you know, traditionally we, we, budgeted a, we budgeted a certain amount of money for scholarships and for a number of years, it was fairly steady. And I think this year we've really seen um, an increase and we've made a few budget amendments to accommodate it, increased our fundraising goal to accommodate it. And next year, it also is one of the places that we did intentionally increase um, with some increased um, fundraising goal as well. It's the only place that we made um, intentional increases. And we're not sure that it's enough. So we will have to. Play that out, but our but our policy so far has been to not turn people away. It is first come first serve, but it's do not turn anyone away. And so now now knowing that the need is really evolving, and not sure we're not really one hundred percent sure what to expect. We think we that's why we need to um, really look at the policies more carefully and make sure that we can help as many people as possible. Well, I don't know how it's going to play out with uh, we ne we never turn anyone away. Okay, further, further counselor questions. Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, thank you, Doreen and Kat, for being here, both of you. Um, and my question is specific to what I noticed in terms of increase of your request in the uh, general fund. And also it seems fundraising and earned are also decreasing. 
just wanted to understand why, why shouldn't we do it like differently? What, well, what, yeah. so there are some, there are some, um, we did budget more realistically on our revenue side this year. Um, we have uh, not significantly, in, significantly increased our fundraising goals anywhere except for with that targeted scholarship amount, which is um, primarily major gifts fundraising. Um, and one place that just had not returned to its pre-pandemic levels of um, earned income is art sales. Um, and that's largely because um, a big part of our, our work in that area was um, has been with the UVM Medical Center and, and related to their capital projects. Um, and they just haven't had any planned. And we don't currently see any planned for um, FY20. So um, that reduced our earned revenue um, for FY24 for everything else, more or less, stayed fairly level. Um, I think that most of the increases on our expense side are related to um, staff staff cost increases, um, with the exception of our our scholarships and a very few other other areas. Um, and the staffing increases are somewhat out of our out of our control. They're related to you know the the cola increases that um, every every one of us are. are um, incorporating into our budgets. Okay. Um, yeah, two more questions. And one of them is basically more of a comment and to just say thank you so much for looking into the um, um, scholarship and also ensuring that there is equity into it. And I just ask that you please consider now keeping track in terms of the number of the people from different socioeconomic background accessing now your um, services. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that as part of your presentation. Thank you. Um, and I haven't heard anything here as part of this presentation specific to uh, the increase of the 2 or 1% uh, for public arts, um, you know, uh, public arts, for public arts around any development that we're doing in this city. Yeah. Um, yes. Can you speak a little bit on that? Yeah. So the one percent for public art fund is part of the, actually part of the capital budget, um, and is it re remains in the capital budget. I think Ashley might speak to it briefly, um, and it doesn't actually transfer uh, to to VCA as an income or expense line. It functions pretty directly out of that line. We we do have a public art manager in our staff that was added last fiscal year. And that's the primary, that's the, the way that we carry out um, the projects in the capital budget. Um, the 1% for public art uh, fund has not actually um, yielded an incredible amount of funding. <laughs> we didn't really know what to expect. We didn't know when we started this down this path. Um, really what was gonna be eligible to contribute to that fund. And we're finding right now we're, we're our, our public art manager is working primarily on projects that are not related to that 1% um, fund. There are really other sources like the Main Street Public Art Project, um, the upcoming potential Shelburne Roundabout Project and other street projects that are there have other funding sources. Um, other than that, that one percent, the amount that we're currently looking at for FY twenty four, I think, is somewhere in the neighborhood of seventeen thousand dollars. So it's not really enough to do anything um, significant as a public standalone public art project. So we'll um, we're seeing it as uh, the kind of long term game where we'll have to let it pool for a period of time, um, understand what other projects over the course of the year may continue to contribute, depending on how capital projects go and then uh, work with the administration to identify the priorities for the use of those funds. Wonderful. Um, you touched on it. I just wanted to ask about the capital, but it seems it's a separate issue. Thank you guys. And thank you, Doreen, for the call this morning. It was good. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, I see Councillor Grant has hand raised. Go ahead. Hi. I just
just had a quick question. Um, as a former police commissioner, I, I look at the park from a public safety standpoint a lot of the time. And I know that activities, positive activities are really important to help keep negative activities at bay, uh, to put it simply. And I'm just curious as to what type of activities you've had to cancel in order to save money. We canceled a series that was a noontime event that was basically a, um, a dialogue, a speaker series. And we've replaced that with a collaboration that we're working on with the Vermont Symphony Orchestra that's going to bring classical music into the park. And it's going to be on a day that we have discovered there's a lot of people out in our community and families are downtown and there isn't really anything happening in the park. So we moved that to a Sunday and hoping that that will bring uh, a new audience. Um, and we also, I mean, it, it's not just our programming that I think does what you, what you are speaking to but also the collaborations that we have with other organizations, like for example, daycares, to encourage daycares to bring their young people downtown and to use the splash pad and um, picnic in the park, et cetera. So I think it's as much marketing to other groups um, who and encourage them, encouraging their use of the park. Um, because that also contributes, I, I think, to the sense of um, belonging and, and expanding the community uh, within the park. Okay, thank you. Um, and just another quick question. Does BCA ever do any cross-promotion with the downtown hotels? We do. Well, yes and no. So we do with our event division, but not really from a marketing perspective. We have, you know, we have our brochures in the lobby. Um, we receive funding for our festivals from the hotels, but we, we don't really, if you're thinking about like, I've seen this a lot in other uh, communities with like pinch deals that are put together. And the problem with our downtown hotels is they they are full, um, and so they, they're not really open to these ideas or, or as needy as some communities are for kind of putting in these packages to encourage people to come in um, because we've brought this idea forward and just hasn't uh, taken off, but it's in the back of our mind. Any ideas you have, we all ears. Okay, I will let you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Bourbon, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Doreen um, and Sarah. It's a very good presentation. I am curious about the 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 line items that would show the um, the scholarships. I'm having a hard time. Uh, locating them. And um, I think uh, um, echoing uh, Councilor Jang um, in terms of uh, trying to, to get an understanding of the absolute numbers that we have there. I, I see some of the, I, yeah. I see some percentages, but that would be really, really helpful to be able to identify the dollar amounts of scholarships and uh, then to um, be able to identify the numbers of people Thank you. Yep. So, so 7730 is the scholarship line item, and it, it occurs in two programs within the budget. Um, one is 175 and uh, 176, both have scholarship lines in them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, could you, okay, scholarships, I see, okay, sort of, that's regional programs, 7730? Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Okay, I see that now. No, and the other one? And the other one is 176, which is um, page. the next page after the first one. It, it, they all say page one. I don't, I don't know how. Right. 
uh, how to tell you exactly which page, but it is the next page after the $4,000 line item, there's a $67,500 line item. So our scholarship, our total scholarship number in both of those programs is 71,500. 71, okay. uh, an increase over this year is um, 57,500. Okay. Thank you. And the number of um, of people, if you haven't, uh, I, I looked for that, but might have just missed that. Yeah, I, I think it's important also, um, Counselor, that we talk to that there are both individual scholarships that are partial or full there, and those are for our classes, camps, workshops, um, studio use. Then there are scholarships that are provided to community groups and school groups who are coming in to do workshops, tours, see, think, do activities, et cetera. And then there are programs that bring groups of individuals in for working within a BCA studio that are also supplemented with the scholarship fund. So we're developing a better system for tracking this all now because it used to just be the individual scholarships that we tracked. And I think we'll be able in a few months to be able to, especially after this summer, to be able to give a more accurate number of families impacted. I yeah, really appreciate that. Okay. We've got a long way to go tonight still. So if there are further um, Further questions on the BCA budget um, and other budgets, uh, just you ask counselors, consider email follow up and we'll circulate responses to the whole council. So, thank you, Sarah and Doreen. And now we will move to the next department, which is the Department of Permitting Inspections. And welcome to for the award. And uh, people are in the room. Um, in the see Doreen just uh, handed out these very nifty little um, guides to see all park summer program in the summer, which uh, is a really nice, uh, even nicer than last year. I remember last year, this one's even better. Oh, that's and, good to hear. We, and, we did uh, save money on that this year. Right? All right, there <laughs> you go. Yeah, efficiency and action. And um, it's awesome to see that it is going to be such an active. Summer again. Bill, I mean, if you get to have pictures of kids uh, dancing, not just to uh, kick your presentation off, but uh, you know, uh, room inspections has lots of critical duties too. So, hand it over to you. All right, I'll start my song and dance now and uh, let Catherine know. I'll use the old fashioned way of letting you know when I'm ready to let it turn my page. You can flip it to the next one. Get it going. Appreciate you having that up and ready. So thank you, everyone. Let's start out. This is not the full group that you see in that picture, and no one's dancing, but that's a mix of uh, some DPW IT staff there. We were saying goodbye to one of our staff members who uh, was leaving after a long career. She left this past year. That was uh, Charlotte Woods. So that's a sort of a hodgepodge of people from different departments, but that's how we roll. Um, that was the photo that I chose to put in there. And Catherine, we can talk about our mission. Um, some of you do know, but not everyone does, that callers sometimes confuse that we do everything there. And as much as I <laughs> like to try, we don't. But the things that we're required to do, our mission is to inspect rental housing, uh, which you probably know is uh, more than 10,000 rental units in the city, and the other housing inspections that are sorry, the health inspections that go along with that include like the, the work with the Board of Health, which is things like pesticide uh, enforcement and the found needles. So we have, you know, probably a couple thousand a year that my staff members are the ones that are picking them up when there are reports from citizens. And I know there were some questions about that at uh, City Council this past week. So that is definitely a connection with my team and the housing division and the, the DPI staff. Uh, the zoning and development review is what people would know and love as zoning permits. They have been for the last few years part of the DPI team and used to be right here in City Hall. And the fourth 
group that you see up there is the trades permit review. Those were part of Norm Baldwin's team that EBW previously, but for the last few years, they are the team that's the trades team within DPI. They issue building, electrical, plumbing, and mechanical permits. And when there are appeals from those types of things, they're appealed to the DPW Commission, appeals to the Development Review Board when people have zoning issues. And if you flip to the next page, you'll see an addendum to some of that zoning work in the bottom left corner. We've added for the benefit so folks know that most of that is staffed by people from Department of Legal Inspections. Uh, we have the Conservation Board, Development and Review Board. Megan Tuttle has primary on the Planning Commission, but Scott Gustin, the Division Manager for Zoning, works really closely with Megan on that. Um, we also staff the Technical Review Committee, which is the team that works with the um, folks who are coming in with large projects to try to coordinate between all the different city departments, bring them into the conference room at DPW. That technical review committee uh, gives those applicants a chance to know what potential hurdles they could be up against before they actually apply for a permit. And then the de design advisory board that's on there as well is another portion of what the zoning team helps to staff. The overall organization is there's a few staff members that are administrative within those other divisions, but that one lone person who started two weeks ago, Alex, is the frontline person uh, who handles the permits as they come in the door. He's still in a training phase, but he's working with the first group, uh, which is a team of the trades inspectors. The second group, uh, I'm sorry, the, the third group along is Scott Gustin's zoning team, uh, planners and zoning enforcement team. Uh, and then the last group is the housing inspectors under housing manager Patty Wayman. Also listed for the purposes of the supervision of that team, they typically report to me the seasonal repeater removal that I'll wrap up with tonight, but Patty helps me with that effort. That's how the department is organized. And so what I've added is, I'm not sure if that one, Catherine, if you had the one that has the one with revenue and expenses, that maybe that didn't make it into that. Sorry, that's okay. I pulled the old one. That's where I, uh, yeah. there was one, and I'm not sure if the- I'll get it. Sure. The, the uh, notable changes that we'll come back to have to do with uh, the personnel expenses. It's not a surprise to you. I'm sure you've seen it with all the presentations so far between you know personnel and benefits. Those increases are going up. The other thing for our department is it's somewhat unique that this year we're just now fully staffed. We've had some openings. One of them was open for almost nine months. So that's a really exciting uh, transition for us that we have what I would consider full staffing for the first time in a while post pandemic. We should be rocking and rolling this year better than ever. Um, but that makes the, the some of the, the, uh, Things that were we saw in savings this year that we didn't use some of those money, uh, some of that money in the budget for personnel and benefits that will be expended in the upcoming year. There's a small increase in the rental registration revenue. Um, we haven't raised the fee. We are actually expecting there'll be additional units that will be coming online before we bill for next year's rental cycle. So that's why that there's a small increase in that uh, revenue uh, line. And the other is that short-term rentals, there's a commensurate increase of about $20,000 is what we're expecting. That we've seen part of that already and more to come. And the last notable change was the rental, I'm sorry, the uh, certificate of occupancy revenue decrease. That's uh, for those that uh, would look that deep into the budget, I wanted to at least give you that heads up that I project a decrease this year because it's already starting to decrease over the last few years. Because in July of 2020, from that point forward, anyone who started getting a zoning permit, the entire fee is collected as part of the permit fee. The old practice, practice I don't want to ever go back to, is where we did a piecemeal and the people had the responsibility if you got a zoning permit to come back and pay a fee later. People were confused by that and led to a lot of people not closing their zoning permits. Because of that change, we're collecting those fees up front, but we're going to see those 
CO fees. We're still collecting them as people close those older permits, but that's going to continue to decrease over next year and the years to come until that's completely gone. Um, but the, the reason I asked Catherine to put that up because it was her terrific idea that it is noteworthy that we have a pretty substantial amount of revenue that we uh, bring to the, the uh, general fund and uh, less in the way of expenses. But for those keeping track at home, we don't have in our budget the fact that we have a great facility that we basically live in rent free. Um, those types of things are not accounted for in my budget. So in, in reality, if we were to be paying for that type of space and the you know, trash collection that Cindy's team does and all the other services that we get, um, it's somewhat commensurate with that amount. So that's the part of, that I wanted to make sure I explained why there's not just a big giant check that we write every month to Catherine and don't get anything back. We get a lot of great service back to include things like legal fees, IT service from Scott Barker's team. Um, really pleased with those types of things. So it's a great wraparound service that we have with the other city departments. Um, on our initiatives and priorities for the upcoming year, I think council is well aware because you helped us to implement these things, but we've got, I wanted to mention it anyway, the rental weatherization, which is the work that we're doing with Vermont Gas, Burlington Electric to uh, drive enforcement on the properties that are using the most energy and make sure that they are first in line to get weatherization. Um, those folks have already scheduled out into uh, about a year from now. So the line is getting long for the waiting line, but we have an additional group of people that will need to come into compliance in 2024. So that line will get longer and the wait list hopefully will shorten if we get more, um, weatherization workers out there, but there's not a lot of workers and we're doing our best to get them lined up into that, but that works going to continue throughout this year and the next few years. Short-term rental enforcement that you know from my report in January will be coming back after June when the properties have to come into full compliance by the end of May. We'll have some additional details on that. Um, we're going to continue our work with our partner at Berlin Electric on net, the net zero energy coordination. Uh, to meet city's goals. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's on everyone's mind, graffiti removal, because the pandemic was a terrible thing for us. And each year at wintertime, it's always a struggle, but we have job postings out for seasonal workers. We will be coordinating not only those workers that will work directly for me, but also with some volunteers who, um, some of them have asked not to be named specifically, but uh, there are people out there in the community that we've supplied paint to and want to be able to help by being a good neighbor. That's wonderful. Uh, I was at the former YMCA this morning and shared a picture with the mayor that the property manager was out there starting the process to eliminate uh, along the College Street side, the uh, graffiti that's on that building. So there's going to be a lot of work to get done over the next few months, but I do expect between that and the work that we'll be doing at Memorial Auditorium, it'll be a notable change. Um, but I feel obligated to say that can't be the only thing that we do because we need to make sure that we're doing something on the uh, judicial side of things because there really hasn't been a lot of work um, to bring some of those folks to justice. Um, and I do hope that at some point we can get the um, criminal justice system focused on that in a restorative manner, but that clearly has not worked over the last few years because there have been very few referrals and no prosecutions. Therefore, we clean it up, someone goes right back out and does it. It's been personally frustrating for me to have that, but I want to make sure folks know if you're frustrated about it, you're not alone. And the mayor and I talk about this issue a lot. Um, we'll do everything that we can to make the positive change that we can try to see that we, uh, let's say, defer some of the people from doing that again. That's a better way to put it. <laughs> uh, so I, there were a couple of questions. I didn't give specific cuts in my budget. I, I really, the areas in the budget line where I cut where I made reductions were to accommodate things that I really needed to increase. When we transferred some of, some of our folks over from the different divisions, not all of the budget lines were lining up. We were spending more like last year for things like cell phones because some of those lines were not um, actually being appropriately budgeted 
two yeah. my department until towards the end of the year. So we were having some overages. I've tried to make some of those corrections. As a result, uh, there aren't like cuts in any of the lines that I have that are matched by some commensurate increases. So I wanted to be very straightforward on that. That the other thing is during uh, the last few years, we've been cutting to the bone our, our training budget. So I've tried to put a little bit back into that because people who haven't traveled for a while will be traveling in the upcoming year. And we've got a highly technical team of people that work the, between the people that issue the permits and the housing inspectors that it's important for, for folks to get out and go to specific locations where they're doing nationally accredited training. So we're hoping to do that uh, in the upcoming year. On the question of wishes, I have to say a little sarcastically, I'd like, I'd like to wish for a little less complicated work. Uh, <laughs> that's, my first, that's my first wish. Many things are complicated by decades of other decisions that were made that you know, it's no fault of the administration or staff members or council, but it's just a sort of a long history of things we continually unwind. We try to do our best, but every every property is its own unique situation. Um, but my biggest wish really is that we remain fully staffed because that helps us to not have to plug the holes with some of the work that needs to get done with having other people do that. Quickly plug a staff member. Ted Miles, who, you know, he's out, one of the people picking up needles, not, doesn't have to, it's not specifically in his job title, but he's also issuing, or he's, yeah, he's doing inspections and closing the, the zoning permits, but when the staff member who left, who was doing the administrative work, he picked up the portion of her job, so he's doing all these different things, I'd like people to get back to their specialties and focus on them, we'll do much better work if people can focus on what their specific job description is and not try to cross into filling gaps from other places. So I think it might be simplistic, but I, my main wish is that we remain fully staffed. So that's what I'm trying to work on stability within my staffing the department, keep everybody happy. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, questions for, for Bill? Go ahead, Councilor Barlow. Yeah, thank you. Um, graffiti is obviously a big topic. Um, do you, is your budget, I didn't see graffiti removal called out specifically in your budget. It's, I think you alluded to it's seasonal work. Yes, yeah, so it's actually captured, and I'm not sure if it's, I don't want to put Kara on the spot if she's already presented or not, but Kara has funds that okay. I'm, my staff, but it's coming through the, the funds that Kara is managing. So I'm not sure where the schedule that she is, but the, the short version is it's approximately forty thousand dollars, with thirty thousand being uh, remaining for staffing and ten thousand for supplies. Okay, and is that like a level funded, basically from last year, or is that a little? It's actually a little bit more than last year, and part of it was we with the last year we didn't have the the staffing. We didn't have people apply. Um, we just had one person. And trust me, I'd much rather have one effective person than a team of half effective people. But the first year when we initially asked for 10 volunteer, or not 10 volunteer, 10 seasonals to give, it, give us right back when we we're sort of opening back the doors of City Hall after you know being closed to the pandemic, we only had three people. But they were three hardworking UVM students who were on their break. I expect as that's happening now, students are deciding what they're going to do now that school's getting out. That's what's likely to happen, that we'll get people that are going to be here for the summer. They ended up last year, the person that worked for me was in the same situation. Um, good workers and uh, committed for a, a variety of reasons. They, they care about Burlington, but also you know, they, they need something to do for the summer. And, Mom and dad, in those cases, wanted them to be doing something productive and it worked out great for us. So I expect that's going to happen again. We'll push the buttons to make sure that we, if we can't get that, we'll press whatever, you know, levers and buttons we need to do to get other people into that uh, pipeline to get the jobs filled and get the work done. Thank you. <clears throat> um, other questions for Bill? Okay, 
I'm not seeing any hands. So, um, hey, there's no final remarks. Uh, we'll let Bill go. And um, next up is Ashley with the uh, CFP Capital Budget. Ashley's department. Welcome. Welcome, Ashley. Still. She's been with us for a while now, but still feel like she's a relatively new member of the team that's really uh, transformed um, a lot of our capital work and our tip work. Thank you for being here tonight, Ash. Well, I was going to start by saying um, that this is an officially I think, a year old now. <laughs> yeah, I would, I'm sorry. Yes, I was yes, so a little. So I am. Yeah, it's been a, yeah, only been a year. So um, I was, I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, to consent budget. Um, I provided um a, a memo as well for it has more information, more more details. So I'll I'll try to just do a quick run through of some of the highlights. Um, but feel free to ask me about any of the information that I have given. I thought I would start this presentation off um, with a quick just overview of the capital budget, general fund capital budget. Um, you know, essentially what's included in this budget um, is uh, public works, tech, tech services, um, fleet. Uh, we've got the parks and facilities teams included in this budget, um, and then the innovations and technology, fire, police, capital assets, and of course our two TIF districts. Um, essentially, we have a city capital committee composed of internal representatives um, from the general fund departments, and they are constantly reviewing requests for capital funds, um, talking about other things, how we're prioritizing our projects, and essentially recommending this annual budget to you all every year. Uh, I also want to just touch quickly on the concept of the carryover budget as a reminder. Um, in the capital world, any unused um, fund within a project or you know, if it's a purchase, any, any unused fund within a project budget will roll over into the next fiscal year to be used by that same project. Um, what you'll see in this proposal and future proposals for the capital budget is any new budgets for new projects or new needs or any additional project need um, that is not currently included in the capital budget. Um, this year, what we are looking at is a proposal that's showing $43.4 million approximately. Um, I have, uh, I want you to see the variety of funding sources that is composing this year's capital budget. Um, we do have some remaining dollars from the first draw of our $23.8 million bond that was approved by voters in March. Um, and so that's going towards some projects. We also have go bond premiums that came from that bond draw, about 1.8, I believe. Um, and I am proposing a new um, bond draw from the 23.8 million of $5 million to help us support capital initiatives that are either ongoing, um, few new ones, and offer our needs in FY20, any FY24. And then additionally, um, we are including our annual CIP, which is a $2 million annual um, bond. And then in addition to all of those, um, our downtown and waterfront TIF projects have their own financing instruments that um, you'll see included in this year's budget. Um, and we also have multiple grant grants across departments. Um, as you'll see in my notes um, in my memo, grants make up about 56% of this budget. So it's a pretty significant source of funding for, um, for the capital program. Um, and this is a combination of federal and state grants. Um, and then in addition to that, the last one is the dedicated tax revenue sources that include paying for parks, conservation legacy, street capital, and green belt. So those are the um, overall funding sources that make up our, our budgets. Um, this budget, I, I am I'm happy with this budget. It is a balanced budget. Um, we are maintaining all the commitments that we made to the voters um, in the March um, ask. Um, as I said before, it's proposing that $5 million additional draw. Um, we've really worked hard. One of the things that I've worked hard on this year as a new as a newbie was to really connect and engage with all of our teams that have um, projects and needs in the capital world. 
to um, really understand um, their project budgets, existing and new. And we worked really hard to work to efficiently allocate all of these dollars so that we could really stretch and maximize um, all of our capital dollars. Um, so I hope you'll see in this proposal that there is a diversity of projects and needs that are being covered with a, it's a nice chunk of money, but there's a, there are a lot more needs. And I hope you see that we worked really hard to do as much as we could with the money that we have. Another point that I just wanted to mention is this budget is proposing to really strengthen the capital contingency, which lives within one of our funds in the capital in the 809, to be specific. Um, it's focusing on building our ability to meet any unknown emergent needs that arise within the fiscal year. And this year, we're also looking to build this pot to allow us to maintain a um, a bucket of money for our local funding, our local matches um, when we apply for grant applications just to make sure that we have that money set aside and we know where it is. Um, so that's one, something I wanted to just let you know. Um, and then also the last point on this slide is um, I was able to work to um, include other general fund departments that didn't have any um, allocations within the $23.8 million GO bonds. Um, by providing some space within the annual CIP to give some departments um, need like INT and fire and police. There were some asset needs that we've needed for a long time that have been deferred and we were able to find some space within this budget within the annual CIP to make it work. So I felt really, really good about that. Um, the next slide is just, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of projects that we have listed within our overall capital budget. Um, I, these are, I'm calling them the highlights we have such a diversity um, of projects within the budget. And I think I just wanted to give that sense to you of everything that we touched on. We literally touch on pretty much everything the city does. Um, you know, we have everything from the Champlain Parkway project, who is a, is a huge project that well, hopefully this is the last year, big year for them. So that's a significant chunk of our budget this year. Um, all the way down to um, some really important equity equity based upgrades in our fire stations two and three and their bedroom bathrooms to really help us um, make uh, comfortable space for um, for women in our fire stations. Um, so we're really touching on a lot. There's a lot of important projects and work, and I'm happy to go into further detail on any of these. Um, there is some detail in my memo, um, but I wanted you to be aware of all of the things that we are doing. And this is just a couple of additional projects that aren't exactly captured in this budget, but we know they are coming. Um, we know the library has received several um, grant funding, um, grant opportunities that are, they are working to finalize budgets and project descriptions. And I am aware of all of the needs and matches. And so we are working to um, finalize those with them and that will be included and incorporated. Um, there's also the Cherry Street Church Street side, Church Street Side Street project, um, which is a congressionally directed spending um, project. And uh, that money, I believe, is coming in um, within the next, like probably fall, winter of 23. Um, I also wanted to give everybody a sense. Um, the next few slides are covering all of the things. This is essentially the carryover projects that um, are still ongoing. They're the behind the scenes projects that you aren't going to see called out in our budget. In our, our budget, but they're ongoing and still very important efforts that our teams are working on every day. And so you'll see that you'll see it basically from DPW, facilities, parks, public safety, um, and parks. You know, I, I divided it up into the work that they're doing, both covered by bond funding and then also what they're doing uh, with their penny for parks impact the end donation dollars that they receive. Um, I want us all to know all the good work that we are doing. The rest of uh, my presentation will focus on uh, the future for capital and just raising awareness of some things that as I move forward through to get through 24 budget season um, and start thinking ahead about how to fund all of our capital needs. Um, these are things that are top on my, you know, on my list. So um, now that we are into year two of this $23.8 million bond, and with the proposal to use $5 million, that'll leave us with $5.8 million from this bond um, to apply towards our needs in FY25. And after FY25, um, 
it will only really have the 2 million annual CIP to apply towards um, uh, any capital products or needs. And um, after that, we don't have an identified capital reserve and there's no other significant dedicated tax supporting general fund capital needs. The current dedicated taxes um, are for very specific projects um, and have their own um, their place where they get used. And I just wanted to share, based on uh, the needs that I have in the, the forecast right now, um, I have a pretty good idea from FY24 to 27. You'll see that in the table here. Um, these, these are the projections that we're seeing in terms of the capital projects and our capital assets um, that we, we know we have to cover over the next four years. So it's significant, and um, I wanted to make you aware. Um, this next slide um, focuses down more on a few, um, four different areas of need where um, I know we're going to need to really work on identifying sources of funding humor. Um, our, our grant funding is huge, and we currently have um, an estimate of $9 million of existing need for projects that are funded with a grant that we know we have to provide some kind of match for. So there's there's a need to find those dollars. Um, our facilities team is doing an amazing job working with their $4 million that they were um, allotted within the 22.8 million, but we have at least $15 million in uh, deferred maintenance and repairs that need to be, to be done in our buildings. Um, street paving, I know Chip and we're here didn't really want me to touch on this one. Our goal is, is the four to five miles a year uh, the GO Bond uh, has provided them with two years worth of funding to do street paving. Um, the last year of that allocation will be FY24, and in FY25, there is no additional allocation in the 22.8 million for street paving. And he has projected three to four year or three to four million dollars of need um, to get us what we need uh, moving forward. And then parks. Um, they have at least a $27.5 million need for deferred maintenance projects across our parks facilities. And they only received a $2 million allocation across this, this $23.8 million. So we know we have a significant need that we have to meet. And they're also doing an amazing job trying to implement um, a lot of different projects at many different facilities um, with that $2 million. And then so last but not least is the fleet. I know you guys have been introduced to this um, topic recently, um, we this year have been focused on uh, this issue, and I, maybe I'll just pull off on this because I know I have a, a slide or two on this. But we have been focused on trying to figure out um, for FY24 how to support the one million dollars of lease payments that we we have um, for vehicles that we already purchased. Um, so, and I will also add. Uh, from this go bond, though, we did get 2.2 million for fire trucks um, in FY23, and that that has happened. But, well, they're ordered. We have them. They are ordered. Um, so the general fund fleet funding needs. Um, in my in my packet of information, I also provide the fleet you know funding history just to give you an overview of how we got to where we are today. You saw a little bit of that in Catherine's presentation. It was last Monday. Um, so our leases, we have just yeah, a little. I was going to say actually, we actually spent a fair amount of time on that last week. So we'll yeah. if there are more questions on it today, we can come back to it. Yeah. Let's, uh, yeah. So this just shows you our plan for for filling that need. Um, and we have additional plans. We know we have a two million dollar need for purchases. Um, there's a series of recommendations. I know the two is going to be reviewing a fleet um, a fleet committee memo soon. So you'll see, you'll probably see that eventually. Um, but we're, we're hoping to build a sustainable fleet plan to help us get um, back to where we need to be for the fleets. And going back to just our general fund capital planning strategies, um, what I hope to do um, this year is, um, I have it's almost a five year plan. Uh, it was a five year plan last year, but now I need to add a year. I am hoping to provide at least a five year forecast for consideration this fall winter um, that will continue to help us fine tune and understand what our, our needs are 
moving forward. Um, that was actually a big task for me this year because it took a lot of time with the teams to think about how to look forward into five years down the road. And honestly, my goal would be to take this into a 10 year plan. That would be my ideal. But I would like to share it five years so we can continue planning and prioritizing. Um, identify supplemental sources of uh, revenue for general fund capital. Um, the prioritization again, I heard you guys loud and clear in the Monday night meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, I've already started having conversations about prioritization um, of projects and needs with departments, and I'm hoping to refine that some more this year. And then um, the last thing I'll just note is we have been working hard to create some procedures that are more related to how teams track and monitor their project budgets, uh, which will also help us uh, better reconcile our final budgets so that we know how much money may or may not be left within a project budget. So um, that has been something that has been high on our priority list. That is my presentation. Great. Thank you, Ashley. The floor is open for counselor questions. I just brought a lot of clarification. Thank you for that. Um, on the looking ahead revenue challenges, are you saying for the four years, fiscal 24 to fiscal 27, we have $181 million worth of capital needs and we have $8 million in the, in the annual CIP plus 5.8 million or 13.8. So we have a, it's, correct. So we have the difference is, is that basically it's significant? It's, and, and that's why the prioritization is really important. We have to, if, if our funding level is going to remain like, if we cannot find another source of revenue funding, we will have to do some, have some serious conversations about what our priorities are and how we're going to fund all those priorities in the coming years. And hopefully, you know, I know bonding is probably the biggest issue right now, whether or not we can, you know, before 2030, likely not. So we just have to get creative and start thinking about what some other strategies might be and how best to enact those. Do we, do we think there may be federal infrastructure money coming? Potentially, that we could use the bus and that down. Or is that like? Well, I think we're doing, we are working really hard. Um, the grants team has been a really great addition to the city team. Um, they have really gotten us a lot of opportunities. The one challenge that I'll just know is many of these opportunities also come with a local match requirement. And we have to find that somewhere. So that's why I wanted to know the local match estimate. Um, it's pretty significant and, you know, it, grant funding is great if we can, if we can get it, but we also have to figure out how we're going to um, come up with the match, generally speaking. Thank you. Yeah. And um, we do, this grant team has been working hard and I, I think we, I've asked Catherine, I think we, we should, before the budget passes, give you some uh, kind of update on what you said on, on, this, on this grant. President Paul. Thanks. And just noting that uh, Catherine's um, the, um, uh, I think the comment that you had made or so ago about the need for the $2 million annual CIP to be expanded. Um, it has to be done through a charter change, but I think that is, it's an outdated number. I agree with you. I think it, I'm not even sure if 5 million is a reasonable sum. I think probably 10 is a more reasonable sum, but I, I do appreciate very much. This is, I am, I am not someone who um, likes to run from forecasts. You know, if there's a forecast and we know what it is, I think we're doing a disservice to ourselves and to the public by not saying what it is, even if it's not what anybody really wants to hear. So, um, you know, I mean, this is an astounding number and not something that we can solve with annual borrowing. I'm not sure if we can solve it with, even if we had bonding capacity, how much we could solve it with. But that's neither here nor there because we don't have that. Um, I just think that I do agree with you that going forward, we're going to have to decide whether or not, um, you know, we hear from the public all the time about street paving, all the time. And maybe, in fact, that's really what people really mostly want. They 
just want to be able to have, you know, they want, they want their streets paved. Um, and that goes for people whether they ride a car or they ride a bike. In fact, if anything, more so if they ride a bike, because you you really are taking your life with your own hands in some of these areas. I mean, they're just they're just gruesome in some areas. So um, that's neither here nor there for this. I just wanted to thank you for the report um, and um, you know and to you know and to say I mean listen our our general obligation our geo bonding is just, is limited. Um, I think it's important for us to know that going going in. And to make some and to accommodate some needs by increasing that CIP annual bonding. I don't know how long it's been, two million probably forever, and forever has been a long time, and it doesn't need to be longer. So it still would take time to change that, but I do agree that that number needs to needs to change without it affecting our bonding capacity. Um, thank you again. I didn't realize it's only been a year. You know, it's funny when people are here for a while, we forget how long. That's actually a, a compliment because it means that we've come to greatly value your expertise. See you. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Castor McGee. Thank you, and thanks, Ashley, for the presentation. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the second looking ahead slide that uh, 9 million number for the local match. Is that 9 million in local matches that we haven't identified funding sources for? Yes. Okay. Uh, we've, we've identified some of it, and I don't have that number for you. I could go back and look at my estimates, but it essentially looks at all of the um, it's a combination of projects that have received funding that we know we were, I guess, I, think, I guess it's best that they were hoping would come out of this 22.8 million go bond, the local match, but the 4 million that we had in the local match from the ways was not going to cover um, everything that we were hoping to cover local match wise. And I think there are several reasons for that. Um, we have a lot of need and there's so many opportunities for grant funding. And then Honestly, the every single department, every single project purchase has been experiencing, and you guys know this, significant inflation issues, and it has affected. We have projects that are tripling the amount that we were expecting them to cost, which affects, you know, it just has a spiraling effect on whatever we thought we were going to need in the 20.8, and it's really affected um, all of that. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, um, I guess. A request that I would have is if we can get if there's if it's possible to get a breakdown of of the projects because you know I, as far as I know the board of finance and the council approved a lot of these projects with you know at least some understanding that the local match would be funded um, and so um, I, just to kind of get an update on where a lot of those projects are at and. Um, where the the gaps are in relation to um, what the projects were proposed as when they came to the the council initially, I think would be helpful. Yeah. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, looking around the room, seeing uh, online. Not seeing any more hands, so I'm going to say thank you to Ashley. Congrats on a year with us. That's, uh, really um, appreciated having your press here. And we will now move to the traffic department. Welcome, Jeff. In the meantime, uh, I'm Jeff Patton, I'm the division director for parking and traffic. And um, an interesting division that I operate. It's, you know, we're all unique, and I, mine's a very special version of unique, I think. Um, 
But I'm hoping tonight through this deck that you'll see that there's a lot of optimism, a lot of innovation happening in our group, but there's also a lot of reality edge to what we're doing in space. Um, so let's dwell on this slide for a moment and then hopefully sip through the rest. I don't get concerned. <laughs> a lot of time here. Um, I run basically a $7.3 million vision. It's broken up into three independent working groups, working budgets. So each, so I have two special revenue funds, which are completely independent of each other. And then I have one fund that sits within the general fund. Um, so Jaden alluded to me earlier in his presentation and get a little more detail on um, what the uh, market services group does in the general fund. Um, the traffic group 264 um, does audible signs, lines, signals, all that stuff. Um, we have the brand manager, Tom Mashtar, who came down from uh, St. Albans. He was St. Albans Town's Department of Public Works director. So he's been a great asset to us. Um, in the parking facilities group, that's also special revenue. We have Matt Fitzpatrick. He's been taken a great leadership role in really turning around the condition of the garages. And uh, Jack Esperti is a brand new parking services manager um, who brought a real sense of customer service, customer experience to parking to get the work done. It's been a breath of fresh air. It's been really great. So across these three groups, we're really focused on safety and equity. You know, some of the things we've done in that, that space of food appliance for food program, we've heard about a lot of coordinating directly with school districts. Um, you know, they're building a outdoor guard, uh, classroom on top of the parking garage and directly on the Cherry Street pickup drop-off situation. Just a lot of interaction with the school district, which has been great. We're working with BED, putting chargers to garages for cars. Uh, and we're developing new uh, creative parking products to hopefully satisfy the needs of our community. Um, particularly in 264 and 265 traffic and parking facilities, we have serious revenue challenges. Um, revenues are recovering much more slowly than we expected. We're still at like somewhere around 75% of pre-COVID revenues. And you know, in, in order to handle that, we're looking at possibly a 15-year debt instrument to handle basically pay for the pain of COVID over the next 15 years. So this is what's talking about the reality pension. Um, despite that, we're bringing innovations around. We're, we're all in on asset management. We're slowly building out our database. So we're going to get every sign in the city, every intersection in the city, every traffic signal, every light in, every, in the garages, every stairwell, you know, all these bits and pieces are all slowly being built into asset management. Um, uh, the permit sales and ticketing, we have a brand new platform. It's called AMS. It's really great. It's allowed us to do a lot of new creative innovation in the way that we sell products. One of the things it's allowed us to do is fairly seamlessly expand and support BPRW parks um, with their retail operations for sales. Um, and then we're also improving service to our customers through empowering our employees, really getting our managers to work with our employees to take their ideas, take their initiative, take their good ideas, run with them. And that's, and that's resulted in things like the parking garages being clean. We talked about graffiti earlier. I'm, not, I'm serious. If you see graffiti in the garage, you call me because there isn't any. We're on it like crazy. And it's the same out in the streets. We're cleaning graffiti in the streets that we don't even call things that we don't even um, and I got to bring out early paint. The clean sweep ended on Friday. We were out painting on Monday. So we're painting uh, like the bike pad facility starting to stop. So anyway, so we're moving. To, we've got we're, we're changing our management structure so we can move quickly with, to address this problems. So anyway, so that's a big introduction. And now I'm going to blast through these slides as fast as I can. Dwell on a few things, but otherwise go with the bike. So. So this is the, the traffic group, it says Alan Mashtar. He manages all the signs, lines, signals, crossing guards, and the meter. All of the revenue for this department comes from parking meter revenue and impact fees. There's no tax dollars in this department. It's all retail, basically. Uh, we also bring in money from meter bags. So if you ever see those orange or yellow covers, get money. So next. So program highlights. So. 
Like I said before, our revenues continue to recover, but they're recovering slowly. Um, fund balance is fully depleted in this group. Um, Park Mobile is 70% of our revenue. This is a huge, that's hugely adopted by, by Burling, Burlingtonians, really like it a lot. Um, just one fact, Las Vegas has a 4% adoption rate. We got seven. So it, it's pretty, it's like, it, that's a big deal. Park Mobile loves this. Um, Graffiti and stickers are an ongoing distraction. We deal with graffiti every day. It's just constant, and stickers. It's just, it's exhausting. Um, our seasonal painting crew, we're having staffing issues. We used to get nine people last year, we got three. This year, we've got one so far, and I don't know if we're gonna get it. So understanding that, we're looking at alternatives to painting. We're looking at thermoplast approaches, tape approaches. There's all kinds of alternative technology. It costs more front, but it might last three or four years versus. Um, and crossing guard hiring is improving. I think you've heard from me say crossing guard barely get 15 to 18. I think we're at 26 right now. So this is great news. We're excited to have crossing guards um, staffed appropriately. Uh, highlights in the budget for next year. Um, we held the expenses flat from last year. Uh, we're now shifting costs. So this is including a shift in costs from parking services. The parking services provides imports for the on-street meters. So 20% of the cost of the parking services uh, staffing is covered by traffic. Split 60-20-20. So 20% goes to parking garages, 20% goes to traffic, and 60% is covered by parking services. Uh, we're also including uh, funding in here to support the Main Street, Great Streets outreach and mitigation planning um, around the parking. Um, graffiti vandalism continues to drive costs, hard costs, and labor costs. Um, but in this, in this, that we're also bringing innovation and signal protection, reporting with the state on that, because the impact fees to fund that. But speaking of things that would advance faster if we had more money. That's one of them because we are laser focused on bringing our signal program up to date. Most of our signal signals in the city are about 25 years. That's ancient. They better be 25 years because that's what they are. They choose the flights. <laughs> um, and I talked about the page. So it's trying to go about the same. So impact of COVID, like I said, it's ongoing. We're still about 90% of our revenues pre-COVID. So after three years of running, it's between 75 to 90 percent. Uh, that's had a dramatic effect on our ability to plan for the future. We just don't have the cash that we used to. The chart on the right, uh, basically from bottom to top, shows COVID at the bottom, and then moving up to so the gray line is uh, 21, orange line is 22. And then you can see the little blue line there is 23. This is calendar year, by the way. It's just easier to see that way. So we are recovering, but it's not dramatic. Uh, but it is recovering. So hopefully with that optimism. Um, but we are talking now about grant opportunities. How, you know, uh, Alan has I had a relationship with CCRBC before in his previous role. So he knows the like, concept of grants. So it's not something that's been a big part of this group. So we're looking at maybe. Doing, you can't re, we can't rely on retail to run the signal system. Right? That's the way we want. So, okay, so again, we go on to 265, their uh, parking facilities. So, parking facilities, Matthew Patrick, he runs the Marketplace Garage, Downtown Garage, Pearl Street Lot, Union Street Lot, Main Street Lot, One Night Door, St. Paul Street, which is underneath Champlain College, the Lake Street Extension, and the Waterfront North Lot, which I forgot. Um, and then all the revenue, all, all the expenses, all the revenues here come from uh, parking fees and uh, parking permits. So again, no tax dollars are coming into this, which is great. So moving on. So program highlights, we are focused on facility safety and the customer experience. That is our North Star. We're focused heavily on that. The past year, we've made major investments in the parking structures to do about $750,000 on structural issues to keep the marketplace garage structurally safe, keep some of the access um, corridors in the downtown garage safe. Um, we've invested lighting, we've increased security patrols, we've put in additional cameras, and we're now live streaming security footage down to monitors at the entrance to the garages. So when you come in, you can actually see, and look at in the towers and see what's going on. Um, now we are supported, so many 
ask about ARPA earlier, we were supported by a million dollar ARPA infusion. So we have that that's been pumped in just to keep us alive. Um, and after that, we're still looking for a three and a half million dollar 15 year consolidated debt instrument to cover some of our ongoing costs and to cover a loan that we already had that we faulted on because we didn't have any debt coverage for that loan because we burned for a balance. So it's we have a complicated financial picture in the parking lodges. Um, so we expect the recovery remains slow. We're exploring new pricing and products that will hopefully drive revenue, provide better, more flexible services to our customers. Um, we're carrying a couple hundred thousand dollars to cover debt for service in 24 before those initial payments to that three and a half million dollar uh, debt instrument. Um, and we're, we, we're, we're carrying funding to start the planning process for the future of the marketplace garage site, whatever that may look like, because um, that facility is 50 years old. Um, and we again increased our security budget to $190,000 from 160. Five years ago, it was 40. So this is a massive increase in security, uh, potential security. So in that COVID, we're still running at 75%. Um, get the charts on the right are the occupancy of downtown garage and marketplace garage. You can see, you know, pre COVID, if you look at the marketplace garage, it's right up at that 85% line. And that and I remember this. I was here then, and we were we were full two or three days a week. You know, two or three times a day, we were shutting the thing down, and and boom, we dropped down, and now we're running sub 50, 60. I mean, peak out a couple times, but we're we're still running half to three quarters of what we should be, uh, or what we were pre-COVID. So we got a ways to go, but again, we are recovering, just slow. So anyway, next. All right, parking services. This is uh, what used to be parking enforcement. They moved into uh, DW, we got Jack Disparity. They run, uh, they basically do enforcement for parking safety and parking equity. Uh, it's all the on street and off street parking facilities. Uh, they run the appeal process, they run residential permit sales. Uh, they manage the garage, the permits for the garages, 265. That's another reason for that cost shift that I mentioned earlier staffing and now recently we just picked up running the permitting program for the parks um, all of the revenue for this group comes from parking tickets and residential parking permits again no no tax dollars in here this is actually a net contributor of somewhere around six hundred thousand dollars right next uh, so hyper focused on the customer experience Jackie experience came from working at uh, Enterprise in car, she was a she was a, a branch manager, so she uh, understands what it's like to run a retail operation. And she's great. Um, uh, let's see. This, this is the second year for Finds for Food, which was again very successful. Pleased to donate forty thousand dollars to uh, Chitnit. Um, and you know, I mentioned I mentioned the cost shift a couple times. I just want to reiterate that you know. Because we've shipped the cost off to these other groups, it's created a lower expense threshold for this general revenue department. So as our revenues increase, hopefully we can increase the uh, contribution uh, to the general fund. So anyway, so we've held expense for fiscal 24, we've held the expenses even. Uh, we expect to make the typical 600K contribution in 24. Um, we are actively engaged in training our partner service agents to be to enforce in an increasingly consistent fashion. Um, we have some that write more tickets than others. Let's put it that way. And it's not that we want to write more tickets. We our goal is to write less tickets, but we need to even out. We get all of our agents to write a similar amount of tickets so that we get the same performance out of everyone. Uh, and I think what's going to happen is that's going to be a net increase over the year, which eventually over time we want to lower. But I think the short game is we're going to have an increase. Uh, but it's highly dependent on community behavior. Uh, and one of the things that we recognize we have the WOOPS program. I think we've probably talked about this before. And I, we're, we're modifying how we're rolling out WOOPS. Um, we're concerned because we have this contribution to general fund, we're concerned about how WOOPS might impact that contribution so what we've basically done is we 
it's had a slow rollout for a couple of technical reasons and just some logistical reasons. Um, and now we're, we've got those resolved and ready to roll, but now we're concerned about the general health of the general fund. So basically, we're going to do a, make a very methodical approach, solve the tech problem. We're solving the marketing problem right now, and we're going to start rolling it out. But as it rolls out, if we see that it has an adverse impact of more than about 10%, what we think our contribution to the general fund is, we will pause it, assess it, and understand what's going on. So that we don't get through a whole year and go, oh boy, instead of making me six hundred thousand dollars, general fund, whoops, here's twenty grand, you know. So we want to we want to have it measured and controlled more. So we're taking it's just a little bit of a step back. We have all of the authorizations we need to run this. We're just taking a little uh, a little breather on how it works. It will roll out in earnest over the summer, but it's just one so wanted to mention that because it is a th this threat, whoops, is a threat to the contribution in general. So, that's it. Sorry, I went fast, um, but there's a lot going on. You know, I know people are very interested in talking about parking, they always are. To <laughs> um, do it, but I'm sorry, nice, we're in kind of different constraints. So, you all, you all know how to find me. Call me. Very good. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, okay, go ahead, Councillor Grant. Thanks. Um, I'll be calling you about whoops. I was just going through my emails yesterday, and I have an outstanding issue. Um, I, I will just say for now that I think it's a great program. The rollout has been very rough, um, and the messaging has been very inconsistent with regards to what our residents can access and what they can't access. So I'll forward you uh, the specific concern that I previously emailed. Um, yeah. I think the city really has to look at this deeply. I, While I think it's a good program, I don't think that public relations wise, it's a good idea to say, yeah, we're gonna do this and then go ahead and try and roll it out again and then say, no, we're letting too much money go, we're gonna stop it. So I really think we need to make a decision, a firm yes or no decision, because from a public relations standpoint, and this one issue that I'm working on, I'm like, oh, we've got this whoops program, you're under 30 days, so you can appeal this and apply it toward whoops. Well, none of that information was available, and then the appeals denied, et cetera. I just think it leaves a very bad taste in people's mouths, so I would just, um, I would just recommend, you know, considering how we want to do this program at this time. If we're going to commit to it, we need to commit to it and go with the risk, or we need to say, given what's happened um, with COVID and we're still not at the numbers uh, that we had before pre-COVID, then maybe it's not a program to continue to try to roll out. Um, and uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Grant. Are there any other parking questions? Council? Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands in the room or online. So we'll say thank you, Jeff. We've got a lot into that presentation. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate uh, the challenging, challenging times of parking and they work on some fronts. Um, we are, are are getting there. We have uh, two presentations left. The Burlington Electric Department is up next <clears throat> as a sizable contingent here to present. Uh, and well branded. Always. I didn't get the best of them on. What are these things? Good evening. I think we have a couple colleagues who are online, possibly as well, Cheryl Mitchell and James Gibbons um, on Zoom. Um, Darren Springer, General Manager of Burlington Electric Department, joined by my colleagues, Emily Stebbins Wheelock, Peter Casti, Mike Anarik, Paul Alexander here in the room. Um, we're going to cover the FY24 budget as well as our proposed FY24 rate change. Uh, just from a process standpoint, we'll be bringing the rate change forward for consideration. Uh, to the board on the 30th of May and then the council on the 5th. 
of June because we need to file it by mid June in order for it to take effect as planned on bills rendered September 1st. Um, and obviously the budget will, will travel separately with the city budget. Um, we have a uh, unique context uh, for the FY24 budget, which really starts with the FY23 actuals, which is that we faced a severely challenging winter uh, in terms of power supply for uh, Burlington Electric uh, relative to our budget. Um, we're actually more than 100% renewable, and we're able to sell excess renewable energy uh, to benefit our customers during the winter when the price is typically more expensive. Um, what happened this winter was there was volatility related to Ukraine, expected natural gas commodity costs that drove the prices higher during the point of time when we were budgeting, and that did not materialize uh, at the time when we actually were selling the power. So it created a negative approximate $4 million variance in our budget for FY23. And that obviously carries forward into FY24 in terms of having less uh, cash on hand as we begin the FY24 process. Uh, it has some other challenges that it presents as well. Um, overall, I, I'm deeply appreciative of the BED team um, for the work that's gone into this budget. It's maybe been our most challenging, uh, even counting the pandemic budgets that we put together. Um, Emily's going to cover uh, some of these initial budget slides, um, and then I'm going to cover the rate slides and we'll be allowed to answer any questions. So over to Emily. Thanks, Darren. So as Darren just started to preview, uh, they're starting start building this budget in a, in a weak cash position uh, due to those low energy prices that we saw for our excess energy this winter. Like the rest of you, we're in a high, a very high inflation environment for the second year in a row. Um, we were happy to negotiate a four-year contract with IBW last year. That contract contains an 18% COLA over the four-year contract. So that's something we have to budget for. Importantly, um, even as we're seeing strategic electrification take off and more people invest in EVs and heat pumps, um, our sales to customers are still pretty flat. Um, we are only about 20% of, of revenues comes from the 80% of our customers who are residential. The other 80% comes from commercial customers, right? Um, so the reduced commercial square footage in the city and the increase in efficiency, which is great, um, have not um, have offset, right, the gains that we're seeing in the residential side. So you'll see in the next slide, our sales are not yet growing at the pace they need to grow in order to keep up with growth in expenditures. Um, the energy markets in New England continue to be uncertain. Um, the natural gas reliant on in New England um, as a grid, and natural gas is a constrained continues to be a constrained fuel. And so we're we're seeing um, not as high energy boards as we saw last year, which were truly unprecedented. But they're still quite high at a level that's only occurred once before since ISO New England was created. The 2022 net zero revenue bond continues to be a critical source of capital financing in this budget. I also want to point out, Darren said we're going to be requesting a five and a half percent rate increase this year. Preliminarily, we're not completely done our analysis of our true cost of service, but where we are right now indicates that we could justify up to a 14 percent increase, given the increases that we've seen in the cost. So we're asking from far less than we believe that we will be able to justify that we need. And that would be the third year in a row we've done that. At FY22, we asked for seven and a half. We could have justified close to 12. And then last year, um, we asked for 3.95. We, we could have justified almost 2% more than that. So really with this budget, what we're trying to do is to keep our Moody's rating metrics at our current levels while minimizing the requested rate increase. Um, we're not in a position this year to improve on the credit factors, unfortunately. This is the slide I alluded to on um, sales to customers. So you can kind of just see over the past 20 years or so, um, the high point there is right after a um, hospital expansion project that happened. You can see some dips for recessions in you know, 2008. Um, you can see the impacts of federal efficiency standards for lighting and appliances starting around 2010. 
And then you can see uh, 2017, Blodgett moved out of town. In 2019, we went to town center, started to close down. And of course, 2020, we had severe impacts from the pandemic. We have bounced back from where we were uh, prior to COVID, but the bounce back level, of course, is 2019, which was our the lowest point in that 20 year period. So we're not yet bouncing back to kind of an early 2000s level. And just to linger on this slide just for a second, obviously our system costs are increased and our unit sales have decreased, partly for good reason with efficiency, partly because of other reasons that Emily mentioned. We went back and looked, and if we were selling as much electricity as we were in 2015 uh, in this budget year, we would have about 3.6 million more revenue uh, this budget year than we have uh, in the budget. So obviously with strategic electrification, we're hoping to bend this curve back upward for good reason, because we're helping people use less fossil fuel, um, but that just is a key economic driver in terms of rate pressure, something that we're keeping a close eye on. So given that that was our, our revenue picture, really in order to balance the budget, we had to do a lot of work on expenditures. The VED team cut over $6 million of, of expense from our budget, from our initial starting point to get to the budget uh, that you see tonight. Um, looking at, uh, at operations and maintenance expenses that are not power supply, are not transmission, are not our required renewable energy standard tier three compliance, are not A and G chartered on expense, things that we could actually do something about. Um, those, the trend line in those expenses is um, one and a half percent, sorry, the trend line is 3.9% on average since FY16. Um, if you if we kept going on that pace that we were on between 07 and 16, that would be a 5.84%. Um, that those same expenses are one and a half percent less than our budget last year and in our current fiscal year. So um, the budget um, that we've developed contains operating revenues of 65.1 million. That includes the requested five and a half percent rate increase effective September 1st. Uh, it also includes uh, sales revenue from the sale of our certain renewable energy credits. Those sales are relatively flat. There's a, a modest decrease, less than 2%. Operating expenses are $67 million in this budget, 4% higher than the current fiscal year. Uh, we have made more conservative assumptions around the price we will receive for the sale of excess energy next winter. That's about a million and a half dollars less than we assumed last year. However, those assumptions are still higher than the actual prices we saw this winter, which was quite mild. So there is still some downside risk in this budget. We have another mild winter. Uh, we could see a, a revenue shortfall from those sales. We're also dealing with a new three quarter of million dollar expense for, um, this is complicated, but there is a, plant in Mystic, Massachusetts, that ISO New England has entered a very confidential contract with for reasons of reliability. The entire region of New England is being asked to pay for this. Um, we have very limited details about the contract. Um, we have, didn't budget for this last year and got hit with it by surprise. Um, this year, we have budgeted for it doing the best we can to estimate what we believe it will cost. Uh, we know that the contract continues at least through May of next year. Uh, we are going to be seeking approval from the Vermont Public Utility Commission to amortize that shortfall that Darren and I spoke of related to those soft energy prices this winter. That will improve our reported net income for FY23 and improve our debt service coverage ratio. It will, however, add ex expense through the annual amortization of that $4 million shortfall over the next eight years. So we've assumed um, that $530,000 expense in this budget, assuming that the accounting treatment will be approved. If it is not, that wouldn't be an expense we record, but we would have different results for FY23. 
And this is just um, worth noting, uh, certain utilities in Vermont that have alternative regulation uh, green mountain power uh, gas, if they see a commodity cost spike, they're able to pass that through with a fuel adjuster, essentially for a limited period of time. They adjust rates upward to cover the commodity cost spike, and then they can adjust it downwards. We don't have that in our regulatory framework. It would actually take uh, likely a, a vote uh, or a charter change or, or, or approval otherwise by voters, as well as some legislative authority for us to be able to kind of access that. Um, so this accounting treatment is essentially a much uh, cruder version of being able to use the fuel adjuster. It's not in real time. It doesn't recapture the cash, but it allows us to recover in rates over a period of years what we lost during that period of time. So taking aside, just to give you a sense of our power supply costs, um, they are only up 2% if you don't include that special uh, expense for the Mystic plant and our excess energy sales. So underlying, you know, and power supply is 28% of our expense, of our expense budget. It's the single biggest item. Um, and that, that cost is increasing, but in the scheme of things these days, you know, very reasonably and very modestly. Um, we have a new cash outlay this year to repay the city for our um, the MOU that we entered to repay our environmental liability payments associated with the RAM. And we have um, a, an indirect uh, an increase in our indirect allocation from the city as well. On the plus side, interest rates are up. So we are budgeting for an additional $400,000 compared to the current fiscal year uh, due to better rates. And our net income uh, for the year will be budgeted at $283,000. That's pretty lean. Uh, it's almost a million dollars less net income than the FY23 budget has passed. Um, it's income. It's income, exactly, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, and then I'll cover quickly uh, capital. Uh, robust capital budget this year. The revenue bond is uh, the primary reason for that. Um, 9.2 million of this $10.9 million capital budget is being funded by the revenue bond. Um, you can see the pie chart shows you uh, the different areas of our physical plant uh, that are gonna be invested in through this budget. Um, production in the upper right is our generation plants. Um, other includes EV charging and fleet vehicles. Distribution is the biggest piece of the pie there in the green. And then general includes things like buildings and grounds and IT systems. Uh, the credit rating factors that we're projecting with this budget um, our revenue bond covenant requires that we maintain at least a 1.25 debt service coverage ratio. We're budgeting to well above that at 3.68. Uh, Moody's likes our adjusted debt service coverage ratio to be around uh, one and a half or greater. This budget, we're at 1.11. 90, uh, sorry, days cash on hand, we aim to achieve at least 90. This budget is 90, exactly. Uh, so it's a lean budget. Um, both in terms of that income and um, the excess cash it generates, which is to say it doesn't generate very much. Um, and then finally, a bit of a preview of coming events potentially as we look at our forecast and outlook for um, you know, net income and cash on hand and financing capital investments. Um, Darren spoke about the fuel adjuster clause. That's kind of a more, that's the most maybe of the things on this list. Um, our line of credit counts toward our dues cash on the end on our new scorecard. It was set at $5 million in 1999, where our expenditures were half of what they are today. To increase that line of credit requires a charter change. Um, we Open would like to request ballot item uh, next town meeting day to increase that line, uh, at least to be in line with our current uh, level of expenditures and perhaps to provide a little headroom for us to grow. Uh, we've never in recent memory drawn down that line of credit. We use it primarily to boost the day's cash on hand metric. And it's just not providing us as much of a boost as we need 
as each day of food cash becomes more expensive. And then finally, um, we also expect to request um, approval for a second revenue bond as part of the FY25 budget, most likely a November 2024 election day. The original revenue bond of 20 million was actually half of what we had identified in terms of upgrades and investments. Uh, but we knew we had a three year period to spend it. We didn't want to ask for more than we thought we could move forward in a three year period. But there is a second tranche that we had identified that we would like to bring forward as part of that. Any questions on sort of that half before we flip to the rate increase proposal? Okay. Um, so we have a I was forgetting the slide. Oh yeah, well, this is an important slide. Um, so we are, amidst all of that challenge, we are investing, continuing to invest in our net zero initiatives. Um, obviously, we'll continue to be over 100% renewable. Um, we have uh, successfully secured a bill, S-137, uh, in conjunction with Efficiency Vermont that has been uh, passed in the House and Senate, waits the governor's signature, that will support uh, even further enhancing our incentive programs, um, which we're excited about. Uh, we're continuing to fund our electrification rebates, our efficiency programs, uh, over $3 million, uh, in total for FY24. Uh, we very much are hoping to bring a district energy go-no-go -no -go decision uh, to you in the next few months. We're working very hard to complete that work. Um, importantly, I think the revenue bond is providing us matching funds, uh, coincidentally, in terms of timing, for a number of federal grants that we're looking uh, to secure for grid infrastructure, for EV charging, uh, and in some cases for batteries as well. Uh, we're working with our colleagues at Parks and Rec and DPW and elsewhere, uh, looking at charging infrastructure around the city, uh, working with the state of Vermont on grant programs that they have. We're very excited to be welcoming, at long last, our new electric bucket truck in FY24. Uh, you all approved this, I think, a year plus ago, and it took us a little while to uh, bring it in, but it's coming, uh, as well as a few F-150 Lightnings that will replace gas trucks that are due for replacement. And we are actually, uh, I think we have a meeting on this tomorrow, uh, we're working on converting our gas turbine, which is the only fossil fuel plant in our uh, inventory, and it's not for sales to customers, it, it's basically a peaker plant that provides capacity, uh, but nonetheless, it, it uses oil and we're working to convert it to biodiesel, uh, so we have an effort underway to do that as well. Um, so we'll go ahead into the rate slides, 5.5%. Um, uh, here you can see the timeline in terms of prior increases. Obviously, we went for a 12-year period without an increase, which was an incredible run. Now we've been in a period of time where we are trying to keep the increases in the single digits and hopefully the low to middle single digits, not the high single digits, uh, which is where we are uh, middle single digits this year. Um, on the next slide, uh, you can see DED's rate at the bottom in dark green relative to a variety of other commodities. I think this is helpful, but actually the next slide is more illustrative. Uh, this is new for this year. This looks at inflation from 2020. Um, so essentially during this period where we've raised rates, and you can see even with the, this would be our third rate change, we're still below the rate of inflation during this period of time. So uh, while we don't enjoy raising rates and it's always a last resort, we try to keep the increase as low as possible. It's at least helpful to be able to gauge it against some of the cost increases that we're seeing. Uh, in the economy, and certainly other utilities in the region are seeing double and even triple digit rate changes. Um, residential rates, you can see we continue to be, even with the proposed increase in dark green, well below the state and New England averages for residential. And the light uh, blue bar there represents the rate that would be effective for our income eligible customers who are part of our energy assistance program. Uh, so you can see they uh, have an even further delta relative to other utilities in Vermont and New England. On the commercial industrial side, uh, this rate change moves us slightly above the Vermont average, but we continue to be below the New England average uh, in terms of commercial industrial rates. And then we have total rates, we continue to be below the Vermont average, well below the New England average. Um, Vermont tends to be about second in the region in terms of rates on the low side, uh, usually Maine is ahead. Um, and has lower rates than Vermont, but otherwise we tend to be uh, lower than all the other states. Uh, this is just another representation of that. You can see the BED current and proposed uh, rates for residential, for commercial, and then across all customer classes. Uh, bill impacts, this is, this is the, the real impact uh, as opposed to looking at the rate percentage. 
Uh, for a residential customer, this would mean on average a $4.39 increase on the average monthly bill for small general, which represents around two thirds or most of our commercial customers, $5.10 increase on the average monthly bill. And then uh, for our income eligible participants, they are getting a 12 and a half percent discount. Uh, so that has a proportionate uh, benefit that's a little bit higher actually as the overall rate goes up. Uh, so they would be saving on average the $11.23 off of their bill uh, as part of this. Now the program originally started uh, with ARPA funding and, and has been supported by ARPA funding. It's a pilot program. Appreciate City Council President Paul's work uh, with us to uh, really kind of help us think this through uh, when we were developing it. Um, we're looking to make this a permanent program uh, coming up in fiscal 24. Uh, the PUC had given us an 18 month pilot. Uh, we've signed up a little less than 150 customers. We think we can help between 800 and 1500 once we fully get going. Um, so we, we just had a meeting with CDO, for example, on how we can do even more outreach to help more folks uh, access this program. And then uh, just a couple more slides. We continue, even with the proposed rate change, to have the best electric vehicle rate in the state of Vermont, and it's not even close. Um, and this is for our customers who are charging off peak uh, using the uh, level two charger at home, uh, getting uh, what's been uh, roughly a 70 cent per gallon uh, rate relative to uh, gas. Pain. So we'll continue to have that favorable advantage when it comes to EVs. And then lastly, maybe we have that last one. Slide. Oh, okay. We had one more slide that I could just mention, which basically shows that in addition to our rates, our customer charge is quite low relative to other utilities. So it is that one. Yeah. So what it shows as we pull it up is uh, the lower electric use you are, the more essential advantage you have relative to other utilities in Vermont because of our low customer charge. So it just speaks further to the relative progressivity of our rates uh, compared to other utilities. You can see us in the bottom, uh, the BED rate and the proposed rate. And you can see the delta um, lower kilowatt hours being much greater. Uh, and then as you use more, the relative advantage compared to other utilities uh, declines. So the more you use, the less advantage you have essentially relative to other utilities because the customer charge being low is uh, essentially a progressive structure. And that was uh, our slides. Appreciate the time and obviously happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you for that uh, for presentation. Floor is open for questions. Councilor Jang, is that a? I think that's just the cursor. The cursor. Yeah, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, I don't believe I'm seeing any, any hands. Um, very good. Thank you, Thank you all for the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And this brings us now to the last presentation of the night, which is the uh, water resource utilities. Megan. Okay, so it's um, the <laughs> Don't worry, there's plenty. We're back here for you, Megan. We're That's back right. For you. I'm definitely getting recorded. And plenty of great attendees still oh, that's online. True. Counselors Jang, Bergman, King, yes. and Grant. Shout out. All right. Wait also, Shout out to attendees, Sharon Busher and a call in listener who I don't know who it is, but thank you for joining us. The story, there was just 
Okay, right. I will. Yeah, great. Thank you. My that's still great. We're waiting for no, no, these proceed. Okay. Well, thank you all for letting me go last. I had a soccer team of uh, young women to coach. Um, uh, so wanted needed to get here a little later. So my name is Megan Moyer. I'm the division director for water resources. Uh, I uh, oversee the other enterprise funds for the city, BED being one of them, and then water, wastewater, and stormwater uh, being the other enterprise funds. That means that there is no, no tax dollar support, and in fact, our budgets contribute in a couple different ways to the general fund uh, via pilot, via franchise fees, so on and so forth. Um, but when we're talking about this, we're, we are uniquely talking about the charges that people see on their uh, water resources bill. As I mentioned to uh, Council President um, Paul, uh, we're gonna post a revised presentation. The end of the story, the rate increase, nothing changed. I double, triple check my model, but I did grab the wrong sort of summary number. Um, and just wanted to make sure that that's clear here and I'll, I'll point it out when we get to that slide. So we, we've got a lot of resiliency principles in water. Um, so the Venn diagram, the interplay of keeping things healthy financially, keeping our infrastructure healthy uh, through our stewardship. And then the third and very important uh, bubble, which is the staff resources. Um, on the financial side, you know, we've been working really hard to make sure we're fully recovering the costs of providing our 365, 24 hours a day, seven days a week service. We implemented a rate payer affordability program uh, two years ago, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what the stats are on that. We finally have started to contribute to a capital reserve when it's possible. We maintain healthy days of cash of op uh, operating cash on hand. Um, and then like BED, we always have to meet our debt coverage ratios for the loans that we have that are still outstanding. On the infrastructure side, we're really working hard and it is a battle every day to work on our operation and maintenance and move away from preventative, from reactive maintenance and more to preventative maintenance. As many of you who are on streets that we are doing projects on, we have up, upticked um, our capital renewal and replacement. And then we're also working on putting in new infrastructure to meet new regulations, uh, whether it is the, uh, the tertiary uh, phosphorus removal technology that we piloted at main plants uh, end of last year, or the rain gardens that you've seen on St. Paul and we'll see in, in Main Street. Uh, there's lots of new stuff as well as fixing the old stuff that we're constantly trying to balance. And then as many of you are aware, we have been really taking a deep dive look at whether or not we really have sufficient staff resources to meet minimum staffing requirements for safe operations and also to keep up with all this preventative maintenance. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in this presentation, but in more detail at the two, hopefully in the May took, uh, which is coming up, I think next week, and if not then in the June took. So overall, uh, at the end of the day, the major expense drivers, we are looking at a substantial increase in overall expenses across the three funds. This is the number that I picked the wrong number. Um, don't worry, the rate increase is not 8.79. Uh, it is less than that, but that is the overall increase in expenses. Um, and this is driven by a number of things. Um, there's, of course, all of the existing personnel related increases that we um, have to deal with. Uh, everybody in the city has to deal with the colas and whatnot. Those are things that are not controllable. Um, and we also, on the other non controllable side, and the orange is the what I would consider the external inflationary increases. And I've called those out on the right hand side. Um, there's some pretty big numbers, particularly wastewater biosolids. We, it's one of the biggest numbers in our wastewater budget. This is the processing of the solid components that come out when we do the water recovery. Um, and those are uh, processed with the help of CWD. And that contract, which we will be bringing to uh, the council, I think the next round, um, we're looking at a substantial about 25% increase. The good news is that that's a less of an increase than what they're seeing across the region. But the bad news is that this is something that we're really gonna have to keep an eye on because it's not something that we can reduce. Um, we can't control it. And so we have to dispose of it. And the, the landscape of how easy it is to dispose of these biosolids is getting harder and harder across the country and particularly in New England. We also saw a really hefty increase in our treatment chemicals. 
uh, while we watch our chemical usage and dial it in and optimize it as tight as we can, these are chemicals that we need to disinfect water, uh, both in the wastewater side and on the water side. And so again, are not something that we can really control. Uh, there's a couple of other things that, and I think BED mentioned it, indirect allocations. There's um, different parts of the city that support uh, uh, water resources and that's in the, the light tan. And then we also saw an increase in the liability insurances. And I actually talked with Paul Plunkett about that. He's saying that's a trend that they're seeing across the, the country that the insurances are having to go up because if there is a replacement, everything is more costly to replace and therefore the, the premiums are higher. So to take a little bit of a deeper dive, so the staffing proposal, that's obviously been the blue, uh, a significant chunk. 27% of this $1.7 million increase is, uh, is constituted by um, some staff that we're planning on with your support adding. And then there's also about 30% are what I'm calling sort of intentional investments, things that we are actively doing either on capital or on the contractual side um, to be able to provide better services and to better uh, steward infrastructure. So I'm sure everybody has questions about the staffing proposal. We did bring in Raptelis, a third party um, financial and utility advisory organization. They were the ones who did the 2019 study uh, to make sure that the, some of the staff and some of our own internal observations were validated. And when they came in, they, they came up with a number of different observations. Um, basically, we've got aging infrastructure and we, have a previous history. So in the recent years, 2016 and on, uh, with the support of the mayor and the council, you know, we have increased our rate of capital renewal and replacement, but there was a really long time where we weren't doing that and we are in catch up mode. Um, we simply don't have the staff capacity to, to conduct needed tasks. And so things like preventative maintenance do fall by the wayside. We're mostly in reaction mode and fixing things that have already broken versus proactively taking care of things before they break. Um, another concept, which you guys have talked about, certainly on the sort of public safety side, is in some areas, when you fully account for labor yield, basically that one FTE doesn't mean you have one, uh, one person there all of the time. And so if you have a crew of four people, you need a crew of four people, you often have to look at having more staff in order to ensure that you have that crew of four people. Um, and so when you look at wastewater and distribution, they found that there were insufficient positions in those areas to meet those minimum staffing. And then the last thing is really high regulatory burdens. Um, since 2016, when I took over, maybe that wasn't the best idea, but since 2016, there have been a number of new laws, acts, regulations that have been passed. And so overall, while we're dealing with the past, we're also having to deal with the future and with all these new things. And, um, it's a lot, it's a lot to keep up with. So again, if you're interested more, have questions, uh, we did attach the report to the packet, I encourage you to review that. We also encourage you to come to the TUC meeting in which we can answer additional questions. But basically I've broken down the, uh, the five different position types, six people overall, um, and sort of checked off which of the four areas that they were at their meeting. So we're looking at, uh, we would like to be able to add two additional water distribution technicians. These are the people who, when the water mains break in the middle of the night on the coldest day of the year, they're out there fixing that. They're also hopefully with additional staff working on things like valve exercising, operating the many hundreds of valves, which are necessary when we do have a break to isolate the break to a smaller area instead of it extending many, many uh, streets beyond. There's also a stormwater field specialist to help with the regulatory challenges that we have there and ensure that strong ordinances that we have um, are actually being followed um, and that we can take credit for a lot of the practices that um, private properties have had to implement um, that'll help us meet some of our larger uh, state and federal obligations. Um, we're looking to add a water resources project manager, not an engineer, but somebody who will make sure that we're uh, doing better on our project delivery. We've got a ton of projects and having somebody who's handling the, the paperwork and the pieces that really you don't necessarily want your engineers to be diverted on and doing, uh, we think, uh, and Raftel is validated would be a good, good um, value add. We're also looking to add another wastewater operator. And then lastly, a water resources utilities coordinator. There's so much work going on in the city. The right of way of subsurface is highly congested. 
And more and more we're finding when we go to dig up something that there's been a water main break, that there's a Comcast line or a gas line or any number of lines or trees or anything that are right on top of our infrastructure and make our already challenging job even more challenging. So I said the rate increase is not as bad as eight. How did we get there? Uh, we went line by line and made sure we looked at the actual expense trends from the last few years and anywhere we could find where uh, the actual expenses hadn't been reaching the budgeted levels, we, we cut those and brought those down to what more in line with what the actual expenses are. We carried forward, um, we had some personnel vacancy savings from FY23, which we were able to carry forward, um, as well as a credit from the uh, overcharge on pilot. And then um, we also went through a line by line projection of what our FY23 final expenses will be for some of our more significant expense lines and then budgeted appropriately in FY24 with the intention that we're gonna carry forward that money. On the revenue side, uh, our overall revenues are, um, and this is a lot of where the offset comes. We had some additional revenue because there's been an increasing volume of sludge production, or sorry, sludge processing from other communities. So that goes to offset some of the increase in biosolids contract a little bit. Um, one of the bigger things is that we have been continuing to phase in the private fire protection fee uh, in FY22. This was part of our new rate structure. Uh, it's something that is very typical for communities that um, properties which have a dedicated or have a much larger line coming into their building to support a sprinkler system. Um, that's bigger pipes, bigger pumps, bigger everything that we need in order to support that. And that wasn't a cost that we were uh, recovering previously. When we looked at what uh, the cost or the cost recovery was of that, the amount we would have had to charge people right off the bat at FY22 was, was too big, I think, for um, our commercial, mostly our commercial customers to swallow. It was also COVID, and so we had agreed with the council to phase that in over a five-year period. Um, so the last year, I think it'll be fully phased in by FY26. We also went through and looked at our billable usage based on FY22 data, and we're seeing a um, slight increase. Uh, generally, things are flat, but a slight increase in water usage, largely due to uh, the wholesale water that we sell to Colchester Fire District 2, which supports a lot of farms. Um, it's always something we have to keep an eye on, because if we have a really wet year, then the farms don't necessarily need as much water, but we've been seeing an increasing trend. I don't know if they're growing their farm fields or what, but. Um, We've been seeing that they've been asking for more water. Um, and then we storm the stormwater fund has a very healthy days of cash on hand fund balance. And so as part of this, we are using a hundred thousand of that in that budget. Um, so that overall budget has a has a hundred thousand dollar deficit um, to balance things out. So where does that leave us? Um, that leaves us with a proposed typical bill increase. So this is a typical single family customer using 400 cubic feet a month um, of 6.5%. Um, that comes out to a customer bill of $55.11, still less than BED, and you're getting three things, not just one. <laughs> Say that. Um, and a reminder that we, we also have a uh, affordability program, a discount program, if you will, called RAP, uh, Water Resources Assistance Program. And a customer who is on that program uh, will only have a bill of $46.12. Uh, $46 so I think that's a 16% discount over what somebody else would see. We have the last five years of rate increases. We did have a rate increase of, five, of almost 5%, well, 4.5% in FY20. We were able in um, COVID to not require a rate increase, FY21. FY22, when we phased in the affordability program, we actually were able to generate a basically a slight decrease uh, for the typical customer bill. Um, we did, and then we did have one in FY23, and then this is where we're at with FY24. Uh, when we look at the overall rate increase since FY21, we're looking at about a 12.1% increase, and this is lower than the CPI or the inflationary change uh, since that time. Not going to go through all of this, but this is the full rate table. Um, how we charge people is that everybody gets a fixed fee, the meter base charge every month. 
Um, and then depending on how much water you use uh, is multiplied by the volumetric rate, which is on the lower half. Um, when, you when you use uh, less than or up to the typical amount of water, 400 cubic feet, you are getting a significant discount in the water rate in particular. Um, and if you use more than that, then uh, you are putting more of a burden in the system and fresh water should higher. Just would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody of the very significant capital investment that is gonna be needed for FY25 and beyond. We too are looking at putting together um, bond proposals for town meeting day. I believe I've broadcast that uh, enough to folks. Um, we need a full comprehensive upgrade of all three plants. We're trying to implement the tertiary phosphorus removal, which will bring us fully into compliance with the Lake Champlain cleanup plan. We've got combined sewer overflow reductions, um, outfall repair. That's all on the clean water side. On the drinking water side, we need to rebuild um, the picture of the 1867 pump house um, that is responsible for feeding the tanks, which ultimately feeds the UBI Medical Center, very, very, very important. Um, the water treatment plant itself has not had significant upgrades since it was built in 1984. Um, and so we are we are looking at all of that and trying to put together a package uh, that will be uh, as palatable as possible to the to the to the work to the customers. I also need to say that the bipartisan infrastructure law, it's gonna provide some funding, but it's not significant. What we're seeing coming out of the feds, uh, there's a lot of money for um, for new things like lead service lines and for PFAS, um, but the amount of money that, Ber that Vermont is getting, I think is in total 350 million, about 150 of that can actually go towards these uh, aged infrastructure type things. And the estimated need in Vermont alone is about $2 billion. So it, it's great. I'm not going to say no, but it is not going to save us from the money that we need to spend. Um, repair affordability, you know, I hope that people are aware of this and can share this with, with their constituents. Um, when there are rate increases, it is very important to me that we have this program so that if somebody who does have a hard time paying their bill, I don't ever want somebody having to choose between being on time with their water bill and paying for things like medication or food. Um, we have these affordability programs where if somebody already qualifies for some other income tape based program, they can show us proof of that and then we give them a discount on their water bill. We try to make it as easy as possible. We also have a senior discount um, and a discount for nonprofit housing organizations. But we don't have a lot of enrollees. We're not spending all of the money that we've set aside for that. Um, I think in total we have, since the program started, only 46 enrollees in the bill discount program, 21 uh, we're qualified as low income and 25 as a senior hardship. Um, our, our rebate program, particularly the sewer lateral rebate program, where we've been paying for people to be able to inspect and video their own sewer laterals so they're aware of what investment they may need to make, that has been very successful. We've processed over 132 lateral inspection rebates, um, and I think we've been able to give about $33,000 away on that. We're not done with affordability. We're still not able to reach the renters who may be getting um, impacts passed down from their landlords. I'm really excited. I've had some initial conversations with BED. We do have lists of renters who qualify for their programs, and there could be some unique, uh, cool synergy where we're able to partner with them to get money to those customers directly. Um, we also we want to look at any number of things to make sure that we are really making it as easy as possible for people to access water uh, because it is it is a, a human right. I think that, um, oh, I guess the only other thing I was going to say on the affordability stuff is that we, we have, my staff has been working really hard um, on the capital projects. We have already pulled in, um, in the past three years, uh, $4.3 million in grants to cover projects that we would otherwise have to bond for. And, um, even with the loan program, the state revolving loan program, we have accessed about $2 million in loan forgiveness. Um, so that loan program has more paperwork than anything I could ever imagine, uh, but it is turning out to be worth it because that's $2 million that we can either repurpose into new projects or you know, not have on our debt service. And with that, 
just a reminder that water is worth it. None of us can live without it. Please consider that as you consider this proposal. Great, thank you, Megan, for, for laying it all out and the proactive thinking on this uh, major challenge and really restructuring of water that you've been leading for, for a year now. Um, last presentation of the night, I know people are getting tired, but uh, go ahead, uh, Councilor Carpenter. Just one question, I'm a little out of the loop here, but one of the um, difficulties with water rates and the renters is there's no way to sub meter. Yeah, and I just I'm just tossing that out because I think with such a high render population, it's something we just need to think more about. Because I think the, the whole bill, the whole one bill for the building, gets passed on to, to uh, the occupants, the tenants, and if one's conserving and one is not, they all get penalized. And this is a dilemma. I've heard the conversations, but I, I really think such a high render population, if we have a more proactive mm -hmm. Way to sub meter would be useful. Um, I think maybe it's something we can have Russ tell us see if there's been any other programs in other cities. I suspect it has to do with the plumbing because unless there if there has to be a dedicated line into an apartment to be able to do this upgrade. I'm not saying it's not possible. Yeah. Um, the just to get a little bit into the detail of what we think we could maybe do with the renters and what camera which community, but basically. By partnering with BED, if they have somebody who already qualifies for their program, because BED they do uh, meter individual units, right? Figuring out a credit that we would basically have BED give to somebody on their electric bill, but that is for yeah. the water, which is different than your time metering thing. Yeah. But just just to know that I'm totally on board. Because yeah. I understand so many things. They have the main meter and then a add something in between and then so yeah, you have to have a separate dedicated yeah. line and every building is a little different yeah. um but but i it's a good idea and i want to look and see if there's been any successful programs and how it's been administered um i think it's largely a plumbing engineering challenge like if somebody's building a new building it's easy to easy to address but let me look into that thank you yes and and also possibly we could have work on um the conservation side like having a a water conservation program. I think it's Philly where they have contractors, plumbers who go into these rental buildings and at least make sure that somebody's not um, having an excessively high bill because it will leaky toilets. That's one of your most common issues. One apartment's got a leaky toilet and they're not recording it, then they could be raising the bill for everybody. Yeah. But... <laughs> Oh, no, see, go ahead, Councilor Jank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Megan, for the presentation. But before I start, I wanted to say, I don't know what Lucy Ciel do you use for the presentation, but it's beautiful. It's interactive. Oh, <laughs> I like it. I, I want to know the name, but I know the time. Um, yes, and, you know, I think something that I noticed compared to the BED um, is basically their rate increases, they went back all the way to over a decade ago to paint a picture about, okay, we have not done it for over a decade, but now we're doing it. And I noticed they have already did it by over 11% just from the past two years. Um, but for your, I did not understand really well the history behind the rate increases at least based on the presentation, but I'll follow up in an email to better understand it. Um, also, I wanted to tell you, I mean, we invested $30 million, um, you know, to fix the problem of sewage overflow. Um, but I also have noticed that you are starting to think about it, like from looking forward before we have to fix this problem again. I wanted to say I'm really appreciative and I completely agree with you about the capital um, uh, bounds for the capital improvement of your facilities. I completely agree. And I also feel that it's timely, right? I just wanted to say, you no, know, no specific question, but thank you for all that you do, the leadership that you're bringing into this. And I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you, Councilor Jang. Um, and uh, we can, uh, yeah, the, the rate increase history is interesting and um, we'll be talking more about it. Part of the challenge we face now is we went, very long period uh, with uh, 
very basically no, no great increases for a while. Yeah, about 10 years. Um, all right. Um, I'm not seeing any any uh, any further hands online. I'm not seeing any further in the room. So before that changes, I'm going to say <laughs> thank you to everyone for sticking it out this long. Thank you for participating. Thanks to the whole team that presented tonight. Some really good presentations, thorough effort, and uh, we'll be back again for four four on Monday. Yes. Thanks, everyone. We are adjourned at seven fifty-five.